Good morning and welcome back to the other faces. Welcome to Scraps and Scrolls. We are at part 17 of A Dance with Dragons. Yes, you heard me correctly, everybody. Part 17, we are nearly at the end. We have this week, next week, and the week after, and then this project is done. Amazing, amazing stuff. Hopefully you can tell I'm excited. I hope you're excited. What a time to be reading these books. We're really atop the mountain right now. We've got so much to talk about. So thank you for joining me for this momentous occasion. I am Sir Buckley, your resident green person, and I'm talking to you from a, well today actually, Happily enough, it's a sunny England. We've had the cold snap recently that lasted all week. Trust me, it was very, very cold here. I believe we had the coldest night since 1995 at some point. My mouse was too cold to hold at certain times, so that was jolly good fun. But it's warmed up today. That's lucky. I need the energy because we've got so much to talk about. And well, like I say, hopefully you can tell that's paying off. As always, I don't need to remind you. I hope you're checking out History of Westeros on the Sundays of the live streams. I know you are. And another thing that's getting to be a regular occurrence for me now is saying thank you for the interaction. The messages, the comments, they're still coming through and I adore them. I'm sure I have the current part of the book that we're talking about to thank for that, but not so much as I'm going to thank you, the listeners. So again, keep that up. We love it. That is brilliant fun to talk to all of you about this, that and the other. And no doubt there's going to be more of that today because we've got some doozies. And in the coming weeks, because again, this is the end, the end of the known series so far. How can we be anything less than amped up, hyped to go? Really, truly, this is awesome. And I can't remember if I mentioned this last week or not, but you do not need to worry about the aisle running out of ideas. I have some announcements in the pipeline. When they all come, I cannot tell you. I'm trying to focus on the amount of pure work to get these last few episodes out, but they are here, they are ready, and I'm excited to share them with you. So just keep an eye on our shores, okay? There is more good stuff, some more very different stuff coming to the Isle of Faces, whenever that may be. But we'll save that for later. We've got this big thing to deal with first. And I've got an even bigger thank you than usual. I know every week I have to do another one because so many people are so wonderful. But in keeping with all these extra comments and interaction, we've also had really, really good numbers of late. And patrons, you already know this. I put a post up earlier this week, so apologies for the repeat. But for you other listeners, I just want to share some milestones with you because, well, you're part of it. You made it happen, so you deserve to know. Things like the fact that January 2021 was our best month ever for total downloads. Now, I think I've mentioned that one before, but still, pretty amazing, isn't it? And then what about this? Last week's episode, part 16, that earned us our single highest day, one single day of total downloads, again, ever in the history of the podcast. So we're reaching new unknown milestones here. And here's a third one for you, the biggest, and this one patrons don't actually know about. But this past weekend, the other faces ticked over 50,000 total downloads. Boom. There you go. Get the pie poppers, blow the whistles, sound the cannons. 50,000 total downloads. My mind is blown and I have to give my biggest ever thank you to you all for making that happen. Trust me, it's not me just downloading it 50,000 times. I think it might actually be you guys. And honestly, it blows my mind. Generally, I'm very emotional about that. That is just incredible. I never, ever dreamt for a second that would ever happen and yeah i know that is an absolute pittance to many other podcasts out there if i was going to get into the business of comparing the other faces to those giants i never would have started in the first place i know some people get that on an episode and it's well deserved but still fifty thousand for this little old operation here amazing so thank you thank you thank you that should definitely provide the energy we need to get through all this amount of stuff we're going to talk about today and i thought well as that's a special landmark let's give a special treat so today Barring anything going wrong in this recording, this episode will be released at the same time for patrons and the general public. Because both of you, both sets have been equally important in getting to that number and I appreciate you all. So here's just a one-off treat for you and it's good timing because we're coming to the end of the book anyway. So there we go, everybody gets to be on the aisle at the same time this week. Thank you, thank you again. But I will go ahead and thank our wonderful patrons because they deserve that of course. And that is where the majority of the interaction is coming, I must say. My Patreon is always dinging me with notifications at the moment, and I love it. So please allow me to thank Law Commander, Namian Darklin, KM. Glenn T is up to his tier and gets his shout out now, so thank you very much, Glenn. And today I'll group Aegon the Six and Archmaster June, Healer of the Lesser Poxes, together because they've both been sending me their thoughts about these specific chapters we're going to talk about today. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, all our patrons, of course. Thank you, everyone, for the interacting and everything else like that. What a time to have such success and such numbers. What a time to be reading this book. Let's get on with what we're actually doing today because it's going to be another monster, trust me. And I'll prove that by telling you which chapters we're covering. We start up in the north. It's actually our lone trip there today with Asher Free. 
The Sacrifice. I love Asher, you love Asher, we all love Asher. Great chapter, not so much on the happy times though. Then we move to a second Greyjoy in Victarion 2, or otherwise known as, unfortunately, Victarion 1, just to confuse you. Then we have a trip to Bravos with Aya 2, the ugly little girl. Yeah, we get Aya back. Oh boy. And then we'll, we'll end with King's Landing as we go to Cersei 2. So I think you can tell from that, a lot of discussion, a lot of important chapters. So how best to sum up what we're actually covering today in our chapters? Well, it's Feast Week, everybody. All four chapters are from characters that featured prominently in A Feast for Crows, although we do get an even split on those who have transitioned into dance storylines more in this book in our first two that we'll cover. Then the second pair, they keep it pretty much strictly feast storylines. So that's pretty interesting to see them all bunched together by George there all at once. And it definitely works for our purposes. But of perhaps a bigger note is that this week we're saying goodbye to every POV we cover, which is obviously completely new for us. It's all last chapters today, so we've really got to look up, we've got to plant the flag and declare it. We're at the end here. We're officially at the end of A Dance of Dragons and the series that we've had so far, which is weird to actually say out loud, I'll tell you. It's pretty amazing to think that we've come this far through this whole project, through this whole series. A big well done to all of you, if you've been around since the beginning, and with Valoridus, of course, I'm including in that. Well done if you're still catching up, that's cool as well. Either way, it's been a long, old journey, and I'll avoid kind of talking about and going down nostalgia too much, because we'll be here all day. But it is, it is a major moment, really, to get this far, and obviously, the importance in the narrative, in its place in the series, is huge, so you know we're going to have lots and lots to talk about in this week and all subsequent weeks because actually from here on out and actually from John Connington's chapter last week but it's a bit harder to count him every chapter that we've still got to cover is a final chapter save for one which is next week's Barristan Free, the Kingbreaker and that's the second to last and it's followed up by its last just two chapters later anyway so there you go other than that we are now in the run of finals so you know we're going to be dealing with huge plot points at every turn lots of drama lots of hard-hitting punches cliffhangers teasers and clues for what is still to come we're in the end zone this is clutch this is overtime everything has led to this basically and case in point George is going to start us off today with a real bang by closing the door on one of the central plots of the entire book the northern war and it's true we'll get a perhaps untrustworthy source of information about it in John's final chapter, but this is the last we see of this incredibly focused and detailed build-up to the Battle of the Vice. This is the last we see of the fate of the North and the home of our main family. So you know, right from there, don't you? It's big guns, it's serious stuff right from our opening today. Then again, okay, we're closing one of the biggest storylines, that's kind of expected, but we're also leaving it open. There's always an element of that, of course. There's always a link to the next book, however far you are into the series. But it's not quite as strong as Dance and Wins, as we've discussed recently. Those two are just linked closer together than the rest. And not every chapter is so bold in that, in terms of connecting forward, as Ashes is. Ayers, for instance, has a, a big punctuation while still leaving an opening at the end. And it's the same with Cersei. Victorian is left more open without the big event, but obviously he isn't as important as the plots we'll see elsewhere, definitely not in Ashes chapter. This is a technique really not employed by George yet, and it again shows off how special the relationship between Dance and Winds is. The build-up just never ends in this book, really. George has decided to leave us on the cliff for huge, wide-ranging plot points not just individual chapters this time around which is what we normally get although we do still get some crackers in that respect for all these upcoming chapters we've really never seen anything match the type of cliffhanger that we'll find in Asher, Barristan, Tyrion and Jon for the sense of the overall. To tie into that the notion of bridging over to winds which again we've talked about a lot lately I'm really interested in how George has decided to do that. We're now obviously leading straight into winds preview chapter territory as well we're, we're bumping up right against those now even though we've had chances to talk about them in the past. And as it happens, I would argue our first chapter today links into its concurrent preview chapter, Fear on One of Winds, more strongly than perhaps any other preview chapter that we get. Only Marine can really match that, which makes sense obviously, given their extreme dual importance. And before we settle into the individual and we actually start talking about Asha, let's talk about this set of four today, because there's more connecting them than just the fact that they're all ending. It's actually pretty amazing how much there is in common between them all. And the first aspect I want to talk to you about is the religious fanaticism, which is just everywhere in all four chapters today. We're going to cover it as we go, of course, but even just looking at the basic situations we're discussing today, their handprints, the religion's handprints, are all over everything. We've got queen's men doing some burning. 
We've got servants of the many-faced God. The faith of the seven reappear at the end. Even Vectarian, who you don't think of as embroiled in such things that much, takes a major turn into fanaticism, and pure insanity as well, when you look at it. I really think George has decided to include this as a marker of the end of days type thing. All these groups really coming out and doing awful things and contributing to the fall of society while all the usual social and moral bonds are broken as people search for solutions. A lot of people turn to religion and it turns out that's perhaps not the best choice for some of them. We won't give too many examples right now but look for it as we go. It's pretty hard to miss but I do just think it's noteworthy that George has lined up all of these examples in a row for us. Religion of course has always been a core theme. We've discussed that plenty of times especially when it really became concrete in Clash, but now they're all spilling over, they're bumping into each other at times, and it's just all going chaotic, as you'd expect for the end of the book. In turn, and sometimes in conjunction with that, this is Horror Week, everybody. Yes, it's Feast Week, yes, it's End Week, but it's also Horror Week, more than ever. And again, like with the religion stuff, I think it's just a tip of the hat to wins. This is what we can expect more of. It's almost like its own preview, in a way. And honestly, I'm mainly looking at Aya when I talk about the aspect of horror we get today, but the other three don't skimp either with, again, their burning of human flesh, their warped rituals, the monster faces that Cersei will spy in the crowd, or the one that might mirror at the end, just to give you a little hint. It is all over the place. Well, that's enough of the overall. Let's get stuck in now. Let's go with our first chapter, which is, of course, Asher 3, The Sacrifice. So right from the get-go, this one is going to play off the expectations given to us via Theon in terms of Stannis being outside the walls of Winterfell. That's what we thought. Somewhat ironically, we might have even thought that Asher would have Theon and Jane walking into that Stannis camp that we thought they were headed to. We just didn't know the actual details of how that's still going to come true, so that's quite funny. We might have even been thinking that the chapter title, The Sacrifice, was something to do with battle. We generally thought this might open with The Battle of Ice. Because we figured that something had happened off-page in the 20 chapters since we last saw Asher, only to now discover it's actually the complete opposite. They've gone nowhere. The situation in the Crofters' village is that much worse, if you can imagine. So we have that feeling of hopeless defeat that we had in the last Asher chapter, that really, really rough chapter, that returns now and it doesn't really go anywhere. If we were expecting something more transformative at the end of the book, or even the beginning of the battle, like I said, if we were to be so greedy, we're going to be left disappointed. Like so much else, George has toyed with our expectations, and instead of punching a bullet point or exclamation mark into the end of Dance, we actually find it's more of a drama-laced ellipses. Amazingly, given the focus and weight of this plot from Asher, Theon, Davos, and extending all the way back to Jon's first few chapters as well, plus adding on that we're talking about the emotional connection to the home of the Starks, plus the political and the overall ramifications for what is going to happen with this battle, we're really truly given nothing. It's the complete opposite of what you would expect, it's quite funny. Again, we've been speaking about it a lot as we move towards this ending now that, hey, this battle's got to happen sometime, uh, my book's getting pretty thin, so I'm going to guess, oh, here's an Asher chapter, here's my battle. No, no, no. Instead, as the chapter goes, we will get some clarifications on what is and isn't happening outside Winterfell, or how likely Stannis is to move, but we're also left on the precipice with far more questions and answers about the oncoming Freys and the Mandleys, how in the world Stannis can mount any sort of offensive, however valuable we might guess Fionn to be, or just how this battle is even going to get started. It looks like it's never going to happen. And that's all without considering the personal fate of our POV, or how she might figure into things, or the hundreds of smaller storylines and tendrils still to be covered at some point, because there is loads in the north, it's not so very different to the wall to be honest. That's not to rob the chapter of its worth in itself still. It remains a tense, if unexpected, chapter, further detailing the fall of Stannis' campaign, if you can imagine there's room for such a thing, the widening cracks between different factions, more and more of which are appearing now, and will hit very hard on two of the main creepy, possibly magical, definitely boundary-testing constants throughout the book, cannibalism and burning. This is a chapter of even more desperation than before, somehow. So is it all set up to put Stannis low so that his upcoming hive seems all the more impressive? Or is it further evidence of Winter's devastating power and an opening to Jon standing alone in defence of the realm such as he dreamed last week? Throw in the loss of faith in both causes and religions that we'll get to see today, the constant threat of the sacrifice, and surprises in the snow, and we've got a hell of a chapter to open today's episode. And after all, I haven't spoken about her enough. This is Asher, everybody, and we love Asher. She's one of our favourites to cover, even if it is in dire circumstances. And unfortunately, she does play camera again quite a lot in this chapter we have today. We'll never get the same level of Asher view as we did in her first chapter in this book, or what we got in Feast. But we do still get some amazing stuff from her in terms of not giving up, even coming to care for her captors in a way, and a gigantic emotional moment at the end. Likely her largest ever, to be honest. That, plus we can discuss the ever-present relationship between her and the very land and soul of the North going to war against each other again. And as I've been saying, it's the last time this is the last we ever get of asha save what we get in field one of winds of winter so let's lap it up because she's awesome 
Let's get to it. We'll start with a quote. On the village green, the Queen's men built their pyre. So George opts to hit us right from the start. They're still at the village. They are not outside Winterfell. So our first thought is, huh? What? What the hell? We thought we were getting our battle. Where the hell is our battle? We've put a lot of work into this book, George. You'd better be rewarding us with our battle. And for that, we need Asher and Stannis and everybody else to be at Winterfell. That was the expectation. Yes, Roos did read out that Stannis was still at the village, but we figured that to be old or false information. Firstly, because there were horns outside the walls of Winterfell, and both Mance and Theon thought that Stannis was there. But most of all, it's because we wanted them to be out there. We wanted Roos's information to be wrong. We wanted Stannis on the march, even if we didn't know how, not stuck in the snow. We figured that was a delay tactic meant to make the road harder and allow Theon's plot to play out before Winterfell was retaken, because we really, really want to see Winterfell retaken. We need those Boltons out of there. We need to see that restoration happen so that Starks can come home and we can all feel nice about it. Besides, if they are not there, then what the hell does that mean for Theon and Jane? Remember that? They jumped off that wall thinking they were going to go to Stannis. If Stannis isn't there, what's happened to them? Oh dear. We had such feelings of success at the end of that chapter, now not so much. And who was blowing the horns? What's happened to both parties, both horn blowers and wall jumpers? So our hearts are in our mouths for that one, which is fitting considering the end of this chapter. Okay, we tell ourselves, maybe it's not going to be a battle from the beginning, but remember Asher's second chapter covered a timeline of weeks, so maybe we're going to see a similar thing here, where we start with them getting out of the village, and then they'll cover the rest of the distance ready for a fight to begin. Or maybe we'll get the fight with the phrase in this one, that would be acceptable, we'll take that George, don't worry about that. Because again, the thing about Asher and Fionn's storylines is that they don't end on the cusp of battle like others do in Marine. We still have stuff to do before we can even get to the beginning once we start wins, that's kind of mind-boggling. So that might mess with our timeline minds a bit, but in general, we could be hopeful. And yet we clearly have things to cover in this village first, whatever happens in the rest of the chapter. The village they're still stuck in, the one that has basically frozen them to the ground and halted the entire war of Stannis Baratheon. And that's all just from the first half of that first line. What about the second clause? They are building a pyre. And some of us might be thinking it's time for a funeral pyre. The cold count was already bad in Asher's last chapter, and will reach eye-popping levels soon enough, but it's the inclusion of the words Queen's Men that makes us doubt it, especially when combined with the chapter title, so our immediate worry is that something's happened to land Asher as the chosen sacrifice, likely because of her king's blood running in her veins from her father Balon, though if there was ever a king to dilute that particular water source, it was he. We were already worried about her well-being beforehand, and if George wants a dark ending to this book, then this would certainly provide one, wouldn't it? Luckily, Alice Mormont puts that worry to bed pretty Pretty quickly, when we find Asher will be watching this, whatever it is, not suffering it. So that's something, I guess. But someone is clearly going to be burnt, and whether the circumstances are punishment or Stannis cracking on needing help, or just something to appease the zealous in the camp, it sets a pretty quick atmosphere of doom that will stick with us through this most dire and gloomy of chapters. Yes, before Asher too showed how bad things could get. Well, just strap in, everyone. So the chapter settles in now, as Asha begins detailing and reminding us of the situation, which can basically be summed up as endless, endless cold, an eternal storm, snow everywhere keeping them trapped within the Crofters' village with their strength failing, resources tumbling, and chances dwindling. It's bad times all around. Even the meagre sustenance that the village was able to provide, and now's a good time to remind you that Stannis only wanted to stay here for one night, has been used up. The lake is empty, and neither Asha or Ali have caught anything in the last three days. The mere fact that these two have been recruited for such tasks, given their nobility and rank, and the fact that Stannis hates letting women do anything whatsoever, tells you how willing the camp is to gain any teeny tiny advantage that it can. Our attention is moved back to the pyre building, as Asher details exactly what it is in an offering to Relor, a desperate plea to melt the snows and help them out a bit please. The same plea that Stannis was refusing to make last time we saw him, out of a reluctance to share the credit or completely marry himself to the Red God, lest he lose the support of the Northern Clansmen, which he needs. Apparently such worries have faded away and Stannis is now going for broke. The way Asher phrases it almost makes it seem like a regular occurrence, but I'm guessing not in the fact that they're still building it. Perhaps it hints more at how expected it is, an inevitability that everyone saw but Stannis refused to budge on until Winter finally broke him down. It is not you the Queen's men want to burn. This is something that Asher thinks in response to Ali not wanting to watch the burning, because there are some things that no one wants to watch no matter how brave and fierce they are. But Asher disagrees due to the aforementioned fort, so again our tension is set from the beginning. We know already that Asher isn't going to be burnt this time round, but she's hinting that some are pushing for that eventually, as was hinted at in her previous chapter as well. And it makes sense, she's the prisoner, she's the enemy, the Northerners are supposed to hate her even if none of them actually seem that bothered by her presence, and there is that King's blood factor which we can't ignore. So we're left wondering and worrying that this is something that's going to be pushed as the chapter progresses. That chapter title will loom throughout, and of course, I don't think I need to say, Asher's burning is definitely not something we want to see, not at all, not ever. 
On the flip side, Asha is still able to conjure a laugh at the situation, so we definitely don't think her time has come just yet. She jokes with Ali about the little need to guard her, given how trapped the entire camp is, that they are still that eternal three days ride away, and she maybe even hints at a slight warming of the relationship between her and Alisane. I'll let you decide if you agree with me on that. I thought we got a little bit more evidence of that than we actually do. Maybe it's in the Winds preview chapter, I haven't reread it for a while. And speaking of warming, so Godry Farring is bleating on about the Lord of Light helping them all out due to this fire or offering, just as we'd expect him to. We already know his lot were pushing for such beforehand, and they've apparently gotten their wish, making them all the more cocksure and dangerous. Their mentality or influence could easily overrun the camp, it seems like, when we know the balance of said camp is such a fragile thing. And we were reminded of the stark difference in the makeup of the camp when the Northern Lords argue back that these fires are making the situation worse, not better, because they've taken the anti-old gods route, both by lighting fires in this manner and choosing this particular form of sacrifice. Big Bucket Wall makes a welcome reappearance now, arguing just that which obviously indicates that this is an argument that Stannis has heard and has come down on one side of, even if it's a side we don't want him to. But he also says something more interesting about the old gods watching from their isle. And maybe you faithful out there might think he means the Isle of Faces. Well, if only. It turns out he's referring to an island out on the two lakes. And the explanation of the surrounding geography, of the village being in between these lakes, is key for theories on the further exploits of Stannis and Winds, especially when it comes to the phrase. But the focus is actually on one particular island that holds a weirwood tree. Now we've always been very excited every time we see a weirwood tree, but that feeling has only increased since Bran's chapters, and we've seen just how they can really affect the plot via what happened in Winterfell with Theon. We aren't expecting a repeat given that this village and Asha herself have zero connection to Bran, but we have to forever wonder now because we know so little of what the kid is up to and what he can do. At the very least, he could see what's happening here, so that is always important. Besides, it's just an addition to the tension and atmosphere of this feeling of the North bearing down on you, as Asha herself tells us when she remembers her visiting this weirwood tree. She tried to stay realistic, but the tree touched something down in her soul as she was convinced it was weeping blood. So that also ties in so nicely with the chapter title and the converse method of sacrifice and what that might mean. And coincidentally, this detailing of there being a weirwood tree here is also very important for future theories that we won't get into now. Instead, we head back to the religious squabbles, as we basically find the two sides of the camp are simply repeating the same arguments that they were before. Corliss Penny says, no, actually your old gods are the one to blame. They are north, we are suffering from the north. This is a northern storm, Relor will save us. Well, Arthur's Flint, he says the opposite, and around and around it goes. The same coin, and essentially that same argument, just over and over. Not that we can really blame them. It's not that there is much else for them to do other than dwell on their pious beliefs and try and distract themselves from the rumbling in their belly. And that's without acknowledging how ingrained religion is in the northern culture or the zealousness of the Queen's men. And that's a generalisation, sure, but it's pretty fair in general. Plus, we know that for the societies of the past, extreme weather events were one of the calling cards of religious thinking and attribution to higher powers because they had no other explanation for it. And for all we know, they are right on the money in this world. So there's a human need to attribute or qualify such things to explain them, and especially in this current state where such weather might kill you. You need to be able to say why. You need to be able to say it's for a reason and not just cruel random fate. That can comfort you in situations such as these, but it can also inspire. If you attribute it to a god or believe that a god has the power to stop it, then there's still hope for survival, isn't there? Aside from the most zealous, everyone in this camp is wanting the same thing to survive. It's just a shame they've taken the split paths. And Asher, notably, cares for neither god anyway. With the pyre now complete, we get confirmation that Asher definitely isn't the sacrifice because Clayton Suggs is told to go and fetch those who are. Asher now gives us a paragraph of thinking on Suggs and how he is one of those simply using the red god as an excuse for his sickening delights of pain and torture. The man is psychotic, especially when we hear what he got up to on Dragonstone. He's Joffrey if he was born much lower. He's a clear villain if we ever get one. Godry Farring, he might be genuine, but Clayton, he uses. And we guess there's probably more users than genuines in the Queen's Men camp, but who knows. Most interestingly, she calls Suggs Farring's withered arm instead of right-hand man, which seems to stand out considering that Victorian's chapter is up next. Is he now Macquarie's right-hand man, even if he thinks it's the other way around? Both are talking about the same god, after all. That's very interesting, but we'll have to save it. For Asher is keeping her sights on what is most important. She is still in danger of being burnt, and this Suggs guy will be keen to light the match himself unless deliverance should arrive in the form of a snow stoppage. That's what she needs. Asha details how desperately that is needed when she tells us that they have now been at the village for two and a half weeks, which again messes with their head timing-wise and what that could mean for our battle hopes, but I never bother to go through and work it out, to be honest. So the fact remains that one night has turned into half a month in the same way their original journey also turned into a disaster. Asha reminds us. 100 leagues from Deepwood Mott to Winterfell. 
300 miles as the raven flies. Ah, uh, yes, we remember that good old phrase, don't we? And how woefully wrong it was. Winter sure saw to that. The snow has not stopped in all that time, so they are still stuck ever colder, weaker, and hungrier as Asher again details for us. The supplies are all but exhausted. The lake's now empty. So the lords, they get all the horse meat, which leaves... What? Well, now we hit on that other big theme, as Asher reveals the camp has resorted to cannibalism. And Asher, who is no meat maid herself, was horrified to learn that four Peasbury men had been carving up one of Lord Fell's deceased men. Yes, she's horrified with this confirmation, but she's not surprised with the suspicion. She knew how bad things had become, what the journey had become, and she knows this is happening all over. But these poor bastards we're about to see were the ones unlucky enough to get caught. So now we put two and two together and figure that this is a sacrifice of punishment rather than something for blood. Indeed, it seems like Stannis is trying to kill two birds with one stone. Obviously, this act, this cannibalistic act, must be punished or the camp is going to break entirely. Not only is it a clear breaking of actual and moral law, but if the punishment is anything less than death, then soon enough you'll have people killing each other in order to eat them after, if that hasn't already started. That's just one aspect though. The other is that this is a convenient excuse to let the Queen's men burn someone without actually having to give up his prize or anyone who doesn't deserve it, because that could have led to some very high tensions as well. So you keep them appeased for at least a little while. You send the message, and who knows, maybe you do stop the storm. I doubt Stannis puts much faith in that, but it'll take any option right now. Besides, the mere hope that it might work from half the camp is probably very valuable, even if the counter is the other half being more miserable that this is going ahead. Asher copies the king, and doubting very much that a red fire god will save them because they burnt four men. But here's the fingers crossed anyway, because if the snow doesn't stop, unfortunately, the Queen's men won't accept their hypothesis is incorrect. They'll demand more fires, and they'll demand her soon enough. Now the four prisoners appear, and with them returns the theme of the broken man. That idea and that brilliant speech comes back to us now, as the four flesh eaters, as Asher calls them, are walked towards their doom. A young crying man, two already reserved of their fate, and a fourth, shouting. Asher was surprised to see how ordinary they appeared. Not monsters, she realised. Only men. Men indeed, Asher, even if they are of the broken variety. If this doesn't get across how bad the situation is, well, nothing will. These men are being painted as monsters because they did a monstrous crime, but they did it to survive. I doubt very much that these four just happened to be part-time cannibals back home and then decided to form a secret club once they were in the army together. So let's remember that broken man's speech. Let's talk about these four men. Let's look at it from their angle. This was not the fate they chose. They are just four normal guys, as far as we know, from the Stormlands. From Poddingfield itself, perhaps, which is a great name. That's where the Peasbees come from. When this all began, they weren't told this was the situation they would end up in. They weren't given a choice anyway. Their lord came calling, and they answered. Then somehow, they were fighting in the Crownlands. And then sometime after that, they were up at the very end of the world, fighting wild things they might have previously thought of as made up. That is strange. It's world-breaking to be so far from home, the other end of the world to them. And that's back when it was all going well. Add Deepwood Mott onto that. Still fine, that's good as well, another victory. But now, on this unending march full of weather you've never even seen before, you're presented with these tough moral choices. You've been dragged halfway across the world from one battle to the next. You're expected to die for someone else's cause at the drop of a hat. There's a superb chance you've already lost friends, that you're already suffering from battlefield trauma. And again, let's point out that they had a lot of success in the North, but now you're out in the wildest wild. You don't know what the plan is. You don't really get what the overall cause is. Azor who? Why should I care about the Ned? What does that all mean? You just do what you're told, and you aren't even allowed to point out how even if this march does end, it super looks like you'll die anyway. You'll be put on the front line if you ever do reach Winterfell, and even if you win, they'll only ask you to do the same thing again later. So combine that bleakness, that missing of home and family, and that threat of war with this punishing march. Remember Asher's second chapter. Remember the pure amount of time it took up before these weeks here at the village. Imagine the terrible freezing cold, the ever-growing hunger, and the fact that people all around you are dying every day from that cold and hunger. The cold count is running rampant, don't forget. That could easily be you the next day, unless you cross this horrific, unimaginable banner, the one that comes with unknowable amounts of shame and guilt and disgust at yourself, but the other option is death. For us readers, it's easy to sit and condemn what, again, is a monstrous crime. It's cannibalism. It's against nature. It's an abomination, just like we discussed at the beginning of Dan's. It's everything we've noted it for throughout the whole book. All of that is completely true. But the difference comes in that we, I'm going to guess for the majority, have never come close to one-tenth of the hunger that these men are feeling, to say nothing of the cold. So we can sit behind our pages and say, oh, how horrible, what evil little men they are. But when it literally comes to a choice between taking that chunk of meat or saying goodbye to the universe, closing your eyes and never coming back, we just can't say what we would do. Again, I'll tell you, 
This is not what they chose. They didn't sign up for any of it. And in a moment, we'll get the argument that they didn't do anything evil. They didn't kill the man. They just tried to live. That was all. So we'll return to that idea in a moment. But let's give the proper context of who these men are and what they've done and what this punishment is. I really think we need to focus on that. In the meantime, we have this fourth, the sergeant of the group. He's shouting this, that and the other at anyone who happens to be in front of him. He taunts Godry Farring about R'hllor, about his cousin dying, which we'll actually return to in a moment, but you're forgiven for not catching that connection the first time. He paints himself as a lover of human meat. He goads Penny about his mother, and then he comes to Clayton Suggs. And unfortunately, we never get to hear that chosen insult, because Suggs kills him immediately. And at first glance, we might wonder why all that happened, until Asher explains that he was being clever, and he's now avoided being burnt alive, because that's how terrible it is. What has it come to when getting your throat sliced open is the smarter, better option? Again, that frames the kind of situation, the kind of day we're in for here. Asha is very clever to work that out, but her wondering if she can copy the trick really takes us down low and makes us feel sorry for her. We don't want to think that, Asha. So did the others know what the man was doing? The others that he was insulting, I mean, and Clayton was just too stupid to understand? Or does he just like the opportunity to kill someone? It could be either. Either way, as the four are still strung up to this pyre, we're reminded of how starving they were, with their physical descriptions, and them just hanging limply against their chains, that also invokes the image of the broken man. This is what this camp has come to. How many are out there watching this, and wondering if they'll be caught next? How many are going to be persuaded against cannibalism, and now will starve as a result? And let's also not forget, this is a class problem. These four would not have died if they were lords, or had decent surnames, whatever, they'd be getting the horse meat. There's a lot of people without those names and the nobility, so we've got that tension that we discussed last time, it's still there. The burning cannot go ahead without King Stannis, who we learn has retreated even further due to the death of Godry's cousin, Brian, the king's squire. Stannis has taken the death hard, apparently. The eternal bonds of knights and squires and such ironclad customs are important to him, and we know he would have hated watching a squire die, even if he and we are sure glad it wasn't Devon Seaworth. But still, there's likely guilt there. He's likely blaming himself. The whole point of this thing is to save the children, remember? Or at least that's part of it. And he's failing. So that's just going to add to his current frustration of obviously not knowing what he's doing, what's going to happen, and kind of the embarrassment of it all, I guess, in a way. But now he's holed up in his tower with the one constant fire. Some say that's to look into the flames, whether that be to R'hllor or to Melisandre for aid. Asher figures it's because he's realised how screwed he is and that all of his long journey has ended in cold failure, a whimper in the snow and nothing more. He'd scarcely... We know how unlikely he'd be to ever accept that given his own conviction, but maybe we agree. Or maybe we have more faith and believe he'd refuse to just ever allow such thinking and he's instead determined to think of another way out. So we've got broken men, perhaps we do have a broken king, especially with the knowledge that such things as cannibalism are going on in his camp. That he led men to such depravity and that they must now pay for it in the worst way possible while others hope to benefit from it. That's a weird line of thinking, isn't it? Yet here Stannis does appear at this important occasion with Richard Hawp on one side and Arnolf Karstark on the other. So that makes us sit up and pay attention if nothing else has. Arnolf Karstark arriving eight days past with 400 plus men of his own, pledging his help. And yet we know, we've known for the longest time now, that he plots betrayal. We've been waiting for this to actually matter for ages and ages, and now it actually does. The betrayal is afoot. 400 men is nothing to sniff at in these times, but obviously Arnolf can't make a move now with those low numbers, he can't just come and attack Stannis. So he's here to wait until Stannis makes his own attack against Winterfell, and he'll then betray him in the middle of battle, we assume. As if Stannis' defeat isn't all but assured anyway. His weak, starving, freezing men will, assumedly at some point, move to assault an undefeatable castle, only to find that the fellow on the left is stabbing them with a spear instead of the enemy. It would be chaos at the best of times, it would be a slaughter in these conditions. And he's brought a maester with him, which we figure is how Roos got the info that Stannis was here in the first place. So maybe Arnolf is just waiting here until the phrase arrive and he'll betray Stannis then. Either way, he spells doom. But no one here knows it, Asher least of all. So this is an excellent example of a reader knowing more than the characters, and us basically shouting, he's behind you, right into the page. It brings huge tension for what this could mean either now or later, and unfortunately Arnolf only brought food for his lot, so there's no kind of relief that we can hope for there. There's still going to be cannibalism and burning and all those things. Asher gives us a quick reminder of the cast arc succession, and a physical description of the man as well, plus the information that if Stannis wins, then Arnolf will be the one to rule Winterfell, given his early declaration for Stannis, the one that's actually completely false. Maybe this is enough to have some wondering if Arnolf is double-crossing Roots, or will go back on the deal, but really, we know that ain't happening. Stannis really doesn't look like he's going to win anyway, even with Arnolf's help. Besides, we really hate this guy for what he helped put Alice through. Alice, whom we love. Alice Karstark, one of the best. 
Now that the king is here, two of the broken men make their pleading case, and Stannis listens, and in a rather chilling moment, he listens, but he gives the order to burn them anyway. Oh, he's a hard forged man, isn't he? He wasn't going to mess around back in the comforts of Dragonstone, so he definitely isn't here. We're reminded of all those early Davos chanters back in Storm. With no mel around, it's left to Godfrey Farring to do the singing, with a song hinting pretty heavily at, Dear Mr. Relore, would you be able to turn the heating back on and stop the bloody snow for a day? And actually, while I read this paragraph, while I read these singing bits, it does frame the pursuit of Winterfell as something of a holy war, which really isn't what Stannis wants. He wants it to be his victory. But again, we've discussed that, and you just can't be picky in this kind of situation. All that remains is actually having to witness the horribleness of it all. The burning of live humans. And we don't actually see this as much as you might think. True, we did get Rattleshirt earlier on, but before then, it would have been back in Clash, actually. We don't even see Alistair Florent burn as far as I remember. It is true, yes, we've seen people burn via a dragon of late but that's not really the same thing still it never gets any easier to read no matter how many times we have to do it especially when you have a weeping boy screaming that he was only trying to eat to live that he didn't kill anyone he wasn't making life worse for anyone essentially pointing out that you're adding to your own problem by killing someone on top of the fell man who already died so here we get the big moral questions can you kill people for trying to live can you kill people for doing that in a situation of your own making like we said they didn't want to come here you put them there, Stannis. So what right do you have to burn them? There are profound questions here about appropriate response and fairness and morality, as there always seems to be swirling around Stannis, where the fault lies and what can truly be said to be evil. It really does make you think and it ties into what we were saying earlier. Again, I'll say they weren't harming anyone. They were trying to live and live so they could continue to serve you. They never asked to be on the snowy march with no food. That was your choice. But now you're punishing them for how they naturally react to it. What else is it you wanted them to do? Just lay down and starve? Because guess what? That ends up with the same amount of dead bodies as this situation. We know why Stannis has to though, we've discussed it. Though it's a point well made that it doesn't have to be in this most painful and cruelest of deaths. There are better ways Stannis is just trying to take advantage. Cruel for cruelty's sake is unfortunately another high theme of today. But the moral questions are most certainly vast and loud and we must consider them. Asha doesn't really have time to consider those questions herself. She is busy suffering through this most awful of experiences, watching someone actually be burnt alive. I very much doubt this will be the last time that we see it, or maybe even Asha sees it. Far from it, in fact. A weeping boy is screaming, remember? Which seems like far too much of a setup for poor Shireen. <laughs> As mentioned before, Asha is no innocent. She's seen death. She's killed before. She's even seen religious ceremonies back in the Iron Islands, which is a hard place for a hard people. And yet we get this. Brutal as that was, this was worse. Close your eyes, she told herself. Close your ears. Turn away. You do not need to see this. Oh, it's Jamie vibes. It's Jamie vibes everywhere. And about a burning as well, so that connection seems pretty solid. George, eliciting this reaction in Hard Asher, while in part being because of her worry that this could be her soon, is also setting up or reminding us that this is evil. This is one of the very worst things you can do to a person. She thinks it, we think it, a good many Northmen think it. It comes back to the ends justifying the means. Mel and the Red Priests claim that their religion is trying to save the world. Now we have our doubts about that mission statement in the first place, but even if we take it at face value, how can that really be true when you're willing to do this to someone? It's evil, it's unnatural, and it seems like the North in particular, which isn't short of its own evils, rejects the notion entirely. I think it's supposed to become clear to us that Stannis, and others, look at the next chapter, are falling under the cloak of evil even while it smiles back at them. After some more disgusting descriptions, it is finally over. The men are dead, the sacrifice complete. Not that we're out of the tension woods. We know George doesn't give chapter titles for events, only people. So Asha is still very much the sacrifice, or the potential sacrifice. And we are still concerned that this chapter will end with her burning or being sentenced to such. To double down on that theory, Clayton Suggs, who's high as a kite after this burning, comes to try and take some more pleasure in the form of mentally bullying Asha, suggesting it will soon be her screaming in front of everyone. George really goes out of his way to show this guy as this brutish bully, from his breath to his blackheads to his thirst for power and pain. Really does paint quite the picture. As mentioned earlier, Asha still knows many want her burnt, even if we don't actually see all that much evidence of it. She says she'll pay for the crimes of the past Ironborn, for what Dagmar and Victorian did to say nothing of Theon and Winterfell. She did her own crimes at Deepwood Mott, but really they'll just see a symbol of the Ironborn when they burn her. It's not even her specifically they seem to want, which I guess you could actually take as insulting if you really wanted to. It is unfair that she must pay for all of that, but we know, or re-readers know, Fionn will be along soon enough. And don't forget that Ironborn aren't liked anywhere, and the Queen's men, they see her as not only Ironborn, but as a savage for her association with the Drowned God, even if she doesn't really practice it herself. 
Again, there's not many calling for her death, but if they decide they need another fire and there's no handy criminals around, then why wouldn't she be first? Still, Asher thinks on how sweet it would be to put one of her axes into Sir Clayton's face, and you really, really have to hope that she's the one who has the opportunity at some point, because oh, would we love to see that, especially when he grips her even tighter now. Luckily, Alice Mormont is back on the scene, again hinting their relationship has changed a bit. Clayton still argues that Asher will be burned, but he does let go. So we have to love Ali having this effect on this burly moron who thinks he's the bee's knees. Her reputation precedes her. Suddenly, Suggs is outnumbered as Justin Massey reappears and agrees that Asher won't be burnt, maybe even according to the king. That would sure be a nice idea if we can confirm it. Clayton is still standing firm on her being burnt, using that specific Kingsbury excuse that we mentioned earlier. It was bound to come up, wasn't it? There's also the convenient excuse that the four just burned weren't valuable enough. Relore needs more apparently, which is just what a maniac who likes to watch people burn might happen to say. Unfortunately, we know others will come asking if the snows don't stop. And Ali Mormont is smart enough to point out the flaw. How far do you go with that if the snows just never stop? Do you just keep on burning people? Do you dare to try a true she-bear? And let's note that Clayton does not respond to this idea, so ha, we like that. Then Asher decides to join in with her friend by suggesting if Clayton was so loyal, why doesn't he burn himself instead? The point being, he is not loyal to a law, and it's also just a basic middle finger to him. So now Clayton does leave, although not without his threats, of course. Asher decides to call Massey her champion by way of thanks, maybe hinting at a potential future for these two, while Ali points out that it's not going to score him any points of his own men. Have you lost your faith in Red Relore? she asked. I've lost faith in more than that, Massey said, his breath a pale mist in the air. That seems important, that seems telling. And who are we to blame him? Do we think this is the only guy to be losing faith? Of course not, it's just the one we're focusing on. Some can throw themselves blindly into worship to keep their spirits up, but some have to look at the reality. Justin, one who was willing to use Relore to gain advancement because everyone else was doing it, remember he was pretty hungry for both Winterfell and Val earlier in the book, has dropped that illusion now because why bother? When your prospects look this bad, and you're thinking you're never going to live long enough for a reward anyway, you can stop with the bullshit, can't you? And to be honest, it was more about staying in Stannis' good books and keeping your neck in the race that all these southern lords are in. Some have maybe genuinely gone over to belief. Horp gives that impression, for example. Others are just keeping up the act in the hope of eventually getting a reward. But also it hints that he believes nothing will come of these sacrifices. Okay, duh, we could say. But more important is his loss of faith in Stannis. Is that just for leading them here to this snowy landscape? That might be a bit unfair, but you could argue his lack of doing anything about it and just keeping himself locked up in his fire tower is what's annoying Justin here. Or is it the allowing of these burnings that has robbed him of his belief in his king? We can't really blame him on either count, but I think that that particular word, the pale mist of his breath, kind of just uh, invokes an idea that Justin's thinning out. He's like an impression of a man rather than a man any longer. He's kind of just fading away. Still, he invites Ali and Asher to dine with him citing that no one can love the food they've got at the moment, but they need to take advantage of what they can. They all have proper surnames, and they can get their hands on some horse, but soon enough that'll be gone, and they'll be in the same position as the Peasbury men, especially when we learn that the amount of horses has gone from 800 at the start to 64 currently. That is incredible. We know they were dropping, but still. Poor horses is my first thought, but have a think of what this means for Stannis' chances as well. Horses can't climb walls, that's true, but they would be needed for any kind of assault on Winterfell. And how in the world would they fight the mounted phrase? So this is bad, terrible news. And even the northern horses are going, and they were so strong in the snow, so we really know it's, uh, it's pretty bad and it's indicative of the mood. Ali does not want to eat after what they've just seen, but she allows Justin to take responsibility of Asher. And again, there is the joke that she can't exactly go anywhere. So Asher and Justin head off, maybe on a sort of date if you want to take that view, but really, they just want to get anywhere warm. And here, we're reminded of Asher's poor ankle. It's very easy to forget. She's still injured. That's probably in a bad way. The weather and the food and everything, that's not going to be helping. And that's just rubbish because we love Asher. We don't want to see her injured. So they head for this hall now, and the building in itself is important. They would be screwed about it. Unsurprisingly, the upper buzz have taken it for themselves while the others are left outside to suffer and then burn for their troubles. It's like how the Great Hall of Winterfell has had to be warped for new use, so is this hall as it packs double its recommended number and has had a fire pit dug inside it. Warmth is lovely, but I doubt it's the nicest place to be. As if we needed it spelled out, even clearer what the status of this camp is, the Northerners and the Southerners have split themselves on each side of the fire. So there's a lot to worry about here, isn't there? There's mutiny from the Lowers for being hungry and being left out in the cold. There's infighting from the geographical differences. So some problems are being shared with Winterfell, just not to quite the same degree. Can Stannis maintain, though? He's got much worse elemental problems than Winterfell, which is saying something, and he's got all this other stuff on top, so really it's a question for which camp is going to crack first. And the Southies, they're really, really suffering, even more than usual, which is to be expected. The Northies, not so much. They expected this. It's the same cold, it's the same hunger for them, they just handle it better. As the two settle with their portions of horse, which are smaller than usual, Justin insists that Asher use his first name instead of Sir. 
and there could be multiple explanations for this. In general, the larger seems his disillusionment with what's actually happening here, their chances, his personal chances for getting anything out of it, or even just surviving, and with Stannis in total. So that might spill out to him feeling guilt at Asher's situation, maybe wanting to do something good with the remainder of his life, or maybe just figuring, why not? Let's make a connection with Asher now, because there's no reason not to, is there? It can be honour, it can be shooting for a star, it can just be the idea of why not. Could be any of them. As we probably expected, the hall is full of arguments about what they will do next, or what they should or shouldn't do next, and Justin is not having any of it. If you want to compare it to current times, you can look at him as someone who knows we've all got to stay in lockdown, while others debate how they can get outside the door first. He knows there's nothing good outside waiting for you. The first case is when Will Foxglove insists that Stannis has seen victory in the flames, and they can now march on Winterfell in three days' time, as if that was the only thing they were waiting on, just Stannis saying, let's go. He says it will be songs and glories all round, likely because that is what so many of them dream of at the best of times, to say nothing of now when all is so bleak. So is Wheel Foxglove, just by way of example, a believer in this idea, or is he just trying to persuade himself that yes we can finally go? We could go round the room and ask if we were honest. Justin's had enough of false hope and lies and stupidity though, as he tells us that the coal count last night alone, just last night, was 80. 80 people in a night. That's ridiculous, it's mind-boggling numbers even if, again, unfortunately, seems very little in comparison with our own problems in the real world. We've spent the whole chapter talking about how bad the situation is, but nothing matches this number. And Justin says, if they march, they will all die. Here's a quote. We will die by the thousands if we stay here, said Sir Humphrey Clifton. Press on or die, I say. Press on and die, I answer. And if we reach Winterfell, what then? How do we take it? Half our men are so weak they can scarce put one foot before another. Will you set them to scaling walls? Building siege towers? Whatever we believe of his motivation, should he have any remaining to him, we can't knock what he's saying. It's the truth. We've fought it all the way through. You've got to think past the end of your own nose. Even if they can continue on, it sure looks like they are walking right into their death based on all available evidence. They are fighting for life, not victory. And you can almost taste the bitterness in his voice and Justin's voice that has come to this. It's like the Peasbury men, but on a much, much lesser scale. He didn't sign up for this. This isn't what he imagined and is certainly not how he wants to end, but stupidity and pride reign supreme around him and he's probably resigned himself that there's no way out short of deserting and that will only end with death by either freezing or burning anyway. Besides, as we say, he's only echoing our own voice. How the hell do you get out of this? Are you going to save Winterfell? What is going to happen to Theon and Jane? Why is Stannis not being more transparent? We know that's not his style in all fairness, but we still wish he would be because these guys really need some direction and inspiration and we want to know what's happening. What follows now is just a prime example of what we've always seen in this series. In some ways it's what the series is about. A bunch of people squabbling and arguing and never arriving at a useful conclusion, all while winter threatens to come and take them down. And it pretty much just goes back and forth between them all with nothing really happening, but let's break it down regardless. So Ormond Wilde begins, a Southie whose advanced age means he's not likely to last long. In fact, there's a bet going on between the men at arms that he'll be the next to die. And Asha wonders if anyone's betting on her. It's an awful idea that we hate to hear, but Asha is still trying to make light of her own situation. Anyway, Wilde says, let's stay here. At least there is shelter and some fish, which is more than what we'd get on a march. Robin Peasbury says there's not enough fish, and apparently he would know for his men who are the ones who have just burned for being hungry, and rumours persist that he might have even joined in with them. That seems fairly unlikely if there is still horse to be had for the highborn, but it's not impossible. If it is true, I wonder if Stannis opted to spare him because he needs his nobles alive and can't risk rebellion from Peasbury men, but I doubt it, that sure doesn't seem like Stannis. I think if Robin was caught, Robin would be toast. A new character, and a northerner, agrees and knows this Ned Woods, which is a good name, just to show this particular argument crosses the typical geographical divide, between some of them anyway, the clansmen might be a different case, but knows this Ned, so named because of losing the tip of his nose to frostbite, remember that for the end of the chapter, says the lakes have been fished out. In fact, he says this. I know them lakes. You've been on them like maggots on a corpse. Hundreds of you. Cut so many holes in the ice, it's a bloody wonder more haven't fallen through. There's places look like a cheese the rat's been at. Oh, let's remember that for some future theories as well, please. That's a big, big part of some ideas for the future. So Humphrey Clifton joins in again and says, see, we need to march. Our only food supply is on the way out. We've got to go. And here, Asha thinks to herself of how repetitive it all is, how the same argument comes again and again, with the same hopes and the same issues, but never a solution. And now again, Justin comes, insisting a march is folly and it means instant death, one that he will not choose. Although, to be fair, not that he provides any further options. When Robin Prees recalls in Craven, Justin decides to go below the belt and call him Cannibal, and the whole place is little more than a playground right now. Still, it looks to be a playground with some fisticuffs until Richard Horp appears in the doorway, unbending in his confidence and faith in both Stannis and R'hllor. He considers it simple fact they will take Winterfell. He talks about it as if it were already a done deal. And that's almost too much for Justin, who the stress is clearly getting to, as he screams out they will never take Winterfell. 
He's had enough. He's forgetting rank. He's about to crack. Which is good work, I think, by George to point out the intense mental strain this environment creates. Not just the worry of whether you'll live or not, but the same bleakness for weeks on end, that horrific march, being surrounded by blind favours. It's probably why he wants to talk to Asher so much. She just wants to see someone sane for a change. And his claim coaxes Arnov Karstark into the conversation, who, to be fair to him, shows off some pretty great acting chops here. And he knows his audience as he tells them that they'll do it for Ned and his daughter, and even for Rob as well. He says they'll kill Freys and Boltons and gets everyone all worked up. He knows the buttons to press, obviously. He knows that'll work, and we know it really annoys us because he is corrupting this noble cause for his own evil deeds. He cares not for the Ned or for any other Stark. And our benefit of full knowledge comes in as we can clearly see he wants Stannis to march and has been persuading the king to do so as soon as possible. And why? Because that's when he can enact his betrayal, destroy Stannis, and then take his rewards. He is an evil man, although he is an evil man with some skills. Besides, only the Northmen are hooting and hollering at Arnov Karstark's declaring. The Southies are now stone silent because they are way past caring about Ned or the Starks or Winterfell if they did in the first place, aside from the castle's ability to save their lives. They just want to get out of the snow, they don't care why. But Justin is undeterred, even after all the noise. He says Arnolf might say it more convincingly. He might get more people riled up than Humphrey Clifton, but the same issues remain. How in the world will they actually take Winterfell? And Arnolf clearly has no reply because he's not actually going to try and take Winterfell, so he doesn't need a response, does he? His grandsons instead fill in for him with some stock answers, ones that make zero sense if you think about them for more than two seconds. They say we'll make ladders, or siege towers, or rams. And, I mean, what, in this storm, in this weather? Of course, every one of them is a doomed tactic, Justin says. We get the quote, and die, and die, and die. So Justin rolled his eyes. Gods be good, are all you Karstarks mad? It's a brilliantly written passage, and we agree... Justin appears to be right. No one has ever given him a contradictory answer for all their confidence. But he doesn't get to focus on that because he's made a bit of a boo-boo. He said gods in the plural. A slip of the tongue is actually what he would have been saying his entire life, but it's a really bad idea to say now, especially with Richard Horpe standing by, who leaps on such a slip straight away. He speaks down to Justin with authority and intimidation, adding a hand to his sword hilt, even when it's not really needed. And he does it in such a way that it's not directly confrontational. He invites Justin to make the issue, while also giving him the opportunity to come back into the fold, which is what the deflated Justin does. He wilts, according to George. He lies about his faith, likely realising that Asher isn't the only one who could wind up on the fire if they annoy the wrong people. Instead, he just gets used to the futility of it all. It is your courage, I question Justin, not your faith. You have preached defeat every step of the way since we rode forth from Deepwood Mott. It makes me wonder whose side you were on. A flush crept up Massey's neck. I will not stay here to be insulted. The flush comes both because this is too close to the truth, and because such concerns are exactly what will see you delivered to the flames. Justin is a breaking man, as Asher agrees, and there is very little left to him, so he opts to try and scrape together some pride while he still can, and walks out. Forever frustrated, faithless, and failing like much of Stance's camp to be honest. It's pretty hard to point the finger of blame at him, he is right after all, and he even tears his cloak on the way out, poor lad. He also sucks at looking after prisoners though. Like her brother, Asher became a camera for a little while there, to the extent that Justin either forgot her presence or forgot his duties, or maybe he just doesn't care anymore. Asher is in no rush to be back in the hands of a babysitter, but she's less than keen to be left at the mercy of men who might want to burn her or harm her in some other way. Allies are sparse, she needs to keep hold of them, so she heads out of the hall and into the snow to follow Justin. And She's lost within 10 yards just to really give that mirror to what's currently like at Winterfell. All she can see in the snow is Stannis' tower, constant and brooding. There is no colour anywhere else in the world. There's just this dim, pale flame, like a kind of weak Sauron's tower. Everyone is just waiting on Stannis. Everything else is white and empty without him, which you could size up to what happens to the world if he fails in his mission. He is the lone flame against the darkness, at least that's how he sees it at the moment. Definitely how Melisandre put it. So she stumbles out into the dark and she hears a horse wicker in the distance. But Asher isn't really thinking on that right now because she winds up right next to the burned men and thinks that the old gods mean to bury this awful work beneath their snow. The work that was not theirs, this isn't how they do things. A burning is too brutal even for them. Which is kind of a beautiful thought in its way. Unfortunately that is ruined by the appearance of Clayton Suggs, who apparently was just stood around looking at the corpses. The guy is a weirdo. And he comes more brash and insulting than ever, brandishing a particular word designed to be the ultimate insult to Asher or any other woman, what I'm not going to repeat here, although Asher has some very smart thoughts about the logic in that and why men use that particular word as a form of insult, I'm sure you know of which I speak. But of larger interest to us is Asher wishing she just had one axe. There's an obvious danger here in this situation and what Clayton might do alone with Asher out in the dark. So we're very, very worried about what could happen. But we also do love that mention of an axe. 
If there can be seemingly random, secret murders in Winterfell, maybe we can keep that mirror going and have it happen here as well. Maybe they would even both involve Greyjoys. It wouldn't help Camp Morale much to find anyone, even Clayton Suggs, murdered in the morning, but it would help us out a bit. So maybe we're thinking Asher could find an axe in the snow and do away with him or, or something like that. We don't care how it happens, we just want it to happen. And certainly that's what we're hoping for. Unfortunately, we're left disappointed. And the only defence that Asher can summon is reminding this jackass of Stannis' punishment for rape. And the way Clayton chuckles in response is super creepy. It makes your hair stand on end. And he actually gives away some of his own faithlessness when he calls Stannis blind. But he also says he will not rape Asher. That doesn't make us like him anymore, but it is a sigh of relief. Or kind of anyway, because he actually says he only won't rape her because then he'd be required to kill her and he'd rather watch her burn instead. So it's just not all that comforting at all, is it? What a guy this dude is. Luckily, Asher doesn't really have time to ponder just how awful he is because she hears a horse again. And then another. And another. It's a good job Asher is here because apparently whoever's supposed to be guarding the camp sucks at their job. But either way, the tension comes roaring back as we start having visions of Freys thundering into the camp and making everything much, much worse. Clayton finally hears as well and manages to get his sword out, but then we get this line. By then, the riders were upon them. That's another classic one-liner from George. So all the tension and worry for Stannis and his campaign and for Asher herself boils to a point as we wonder if this is it. Maybe this is the big bang to end the book or end this plotline at least. And for many of us on the first time reader scale, we probably didn't even realise that Asher's descriptions of the riders don't match up with our mental pictures. When you look at it, they are clearly Northmen, not Freys, even if Asher can't confirm who they are and isn't really bothered about identity right now. She knows enemies, she knows danger, and she figures this is it coming towards her. And because Asher is awesome, she isn't even thinking about herself directly. She's thinking about saving this camp full of people who hate her and would have imprisoned her and who might want to burn her. She still wants to raise the alarm. So if you're ever in doubt about the awesomeness of Asher, which you never should be, there's some more evidence for you. And Clayton also stands them down, and Asher even notes his courage in protecting the king that he only semi cares for. Now, I don't think that gives him a pass for how rubbish he is, but still, it is cool. And Clayton asks the question we're all asking. Who goes there? And when these riders stop, Asher tells us their numbers aren't all that high, so okay, probably not the phrase. But she's still worried that Roose Bolton might be here in some form, until she starts to think about it, and especially until she recognises two men of the Night's Watch. And unless we have impeccable memories, first timers are probably completely clueless about what's going on here, until she's the one who asks the question. Who are you? she called. Friends, a half familiar voice replied. We looked for you at Winterfell, but found only crow food umber beating drums and blowing horns. It took some time to find you. The rider vaulted from his saddle, pulled back his hood and bowed. So thick was his beard and so crusted with ice that for a moment Asher did not know him. Then it came. Triss, she said. Triss? Triss! And Carl and Grimtongue and all the others coming out of the snow, coming to save their captain in her most perilous moment it is... Amazing, it's a great feeling. I love this little reveal here. I love this reunion. And two of these people, two of these members of the crew, they're not only saving their captain, but the woman they love. And even if Asher doesn't reciprocate towards Triss, she still clearly cares for him, and she is still unbelievably thankful for his appearance right here now in this particular moment. She can't believe it. We can't believe it. We both thought that was it for these people being together, but somehow, out of complete left field, they have re-entered the plot. And short of being out of this situation entirely, there is honestly nothing in the world that Asher would want more than a reunion with her crew, so we know the emotional worth of this moment. We talk about reunions a lot as the books progress, and there's some key emotional ones out there, we've discussed them before, but I don't think this one should be discounted. These friends finding each other again, somehow, against all odds. And to be honest, it's too much of a surprise for us to really even think about what this might mean for Asher's future, or who the other riders are, or how in the world they got here. We all ask those too quickly to give them due attention. Our eyes are moving across the page too quickly now. But what does stand out is a key bit of information that Triss slipped in there. It is Crowfood Umber who is outside the walls of Winterfell playing drums and messing with those inside. So that reveals all that has been going on. It confirms that we're not going to get that super big battle and it also again brings up the question, what happened to Fionn and Jane then? Now I have to leave that for a second because Clayton, he's got no idea what's going on but his questions are answered by none other than Tycho Nostoris. Fresh off of taking John's advice and then being ballsy enough to just ride through a snowstorm war zone because banks, apparently, do not stop for anything. It was too absurd. She had to laugh. Yeah, you're damn right, Asher. I think we know what you mean. But then it becomes even more absurd when Taicho identifies Asher and tells her he has a gift. One found by Moore's Umber under the walls of Winterfell. And really, just that sentence enough, that gets us thinking. We don't dare to dream, do we? At least not until Asher thinks this. A girl and an old man. And then we're thinking, oh yeah. We know who it is. Time to set the fireworks. Let's read on. Here's the final quote. Here's the ending of the chapter. He raised his eyes. Sister. See, this time I knew you. 
Asher's heart skipped a beat. Theon? His lips skinned back in what might have been a grin. Half his teeth were gone, and half of those still left him were broken and splintered. Theon, he repeated. My name is Theon. You have to know your name. Well, take a breath, I think, because... Where do we even start here, honestly? I mean, I know this is a big moment in the book, it's the ending of a big plotline, but still, George, you're just overloading us. If Asher's jaw wasn't on the floor to begin with, it is now deep beneath the snow somewhere. She never expected to see her crew again, let alone the brother she's basically had to cast off as dead, despite her early idea for him back at Deepwood Mott, which is another little spark we'll remember long after actually finishing this chapter, which you could probably say about all the ending chapters now, things just don't occur to you until later. That's just part of the fun of a song of ice and fire though. And now what I'm questioning is, is this the first time we've had family members have a second reunion after huge absences? Yeah, you might be able to throw Cat and Rob in there, they kind of break apart and come back together a few times, but I think generally these two take it. As we mentioned in previous Fionn chapters, let's compare this reunion to their first, that hilarious chapter where Asher played Esgrid and it was all fun and games back down in the Iron Islands. Now look at where they are, in the middle of a storm, on the brink of battle, in a war really, one hobbled and a prisoner, one completely broken, almost beyond comprehension. So really there's no bigger setting of just how much things have changed and progressed. We never dared hope, even when we first realised that we'd have two Greyjoys on either side of the battle, that this would actually happen. Surely the chances of both of them surviving were minuscule in the first place, but now it's wound up happening even before the battle begins. I don't think I need to repeat myself to point out the huge emotional landmark it is for both of them, sure, but especially for Theon, who never dreamed he'd see any of his family again, especially the single one that actually likes him, at least a little bit. For all of their rivalry and tension beforehand, it just seems more than ridiculous now given what's actually happened, so maybe they'll appreciate what they still have in each other for as long as they can. Also, it's just fitting that these two, who were such large proponents in the fall of the North, will now be pushed together to see the end result of what they've done or what they started, or at least helped start. It gives Asha someone else to fight for, to try and treasure while she can, and perhaps even do more with if they ever do get out of this. Obviously, that's going to be a very, very difficult process, accepting what has happened to her brother, and an even longer one for Theon to get used to a society without Ramsay again, assuming that he doesn't have to go back into his clutches in some way. And really, we don't even know if that's possible, do we? We've got no idea about the long-term effects of what's going to happen to Theon and what he can really get back. These are other things that we're just going to keep thinking about long after finishing this chapter, or even after reading the preview chapter. But for the right here and now, it's just wonderful to see them back together. And further than that, as important as it is, let's move the camera slightly around this scene. Let's move from Asher past Theon to Jane, because this is the confirmation. Let those fireworks off. It worked. Theon did save Jane. They did survive the fall and they okay, had some amazing luck, but they got out of there. Jane is saved, everybody. Ring the bells. Light the matches, put the party on. This is the best news we've probably ever had in this series, at least for a very, very long time. After all of the focus that we've given Jane and that awful backstory that we covered in the incredibly dramatic Fionn chapter, it all actually did pay off. She's free of Ramsay. Now, okay, she's still been injured by the snow and the cold. She's still obviously unimaginably wounded on the inside, but she is away from him. So how wonderful it is for George to actually include that amazing note for us at the end of a book so dark with another darker book still to come. It's very nice of him. He could have just left it, couldn't he? But no, nice, nice, nice. Thank you, George. And Theon ends the chapter with that confirmation of finally knowing his name, of knowing that that was the right path to doing the right thing, going back to his true self. And there's that breaking of the mind prison, or at least that partial breaking. As we said at the end of his arc, that was what was so important. I know it's not wiping away all that's come before and all that he's done, but don't worry, we have enough losses in these books, let's just take the win while we can, and again I'll say it, I officially declare that Jane Poole is the most important of these. I won't submit you to another long rant, but hers is the story that needs to be told, she is the one who needs our focus. Now obviously, in general, this is a hell of a cliffhanger to leave this plot on because we still don't have our great big gigantic battle yet. So that on its own makes a pretty big cliff, but what about the specific ending here? Well there's lots of questions there too, and first in my mind is what becomes of Jane's identity? Is she able to keep it up as Aya? What does Tychon Nostoris think? Is he under the impression that she's actually Aya? We would assume so. Will she be immediately identified? Maybe someone in this camp actually has seen Aya, we don't know. And how would Stannis react to either possibility? If he does think it's Aya, does he keep her safe? Does he send her on to Jon? Well, we might find out some answers to that in the preview chapter, and I told you how much that tied in, but I'm going to hold off on talking about that too much now. Important as it is, we can talk about it later, because there's still so much to cover just here. Now that potential of gaining who he thinks is Aya could potentially be a feather in Stannis' cap if he does win, but much more important are the arrivals of both Theon and Tycho and Astorus. Theon will be incredibly valuable for this mission, even if he had never returned to Winterfell after going to Pike. He'd still know the castle better than anyone in Stannis' camp, and 
many were left in the north, to be honest, and that is sorely needed for Stannis to have any chance of success. Add into that the knowledge of what's going on currently, he's only just left, he knows the weak spots, the array of the defences, the fact that the Freys are on the way now, he has the knowledge of Arnolf Karstark, ding ding ding, yeah, preview chapter notes. Again, we'll cover that later, but just from now, we can see how much he changes the circumstances, and he's essentially going to breathe life into this freezing, dying camp. What Theon does is represent a chance for these people. Yeah, Theon, of all people. And Taicho delivers the same thing for Stannis, maybe with a more overall view. With the offer that he's going to bring him, the one he discussed with John earlier, Stannis has the chance to actually grasp the legitimacy that he's been seeking since he pretty much began, as well as funds needed for any and all purposes. There's a long road to go still in this war and this battle for humanity, but given all they've suffered through of this storm, it's definitely exciting, isn't it? And if we're talking about questions, then we still have loads of them about Theon specifically. He is a guilty man who's just been placed in the hands of the most just, in which we mean Stannis, of course. His whole thing is justice, so how does he work coming up against one of the most guilty in Theon, and yet a man who's also worth a lot and has done some good of late? How is Stannis going to react to that? Then there's more on top of that. Where does Asha's crew fit into all of this? Where does she herself fit into it? She's still a prisoner, in danger of being sacrificed at some point, that hasn't gone anywhere. And then we get our larger questions and theories about what will happen in the battle and after, but if I'm honest, I've done those enough in other places, especially the Castles book, so you probably don't need me repeating them. If you are unaware and want to know about any, you can always get in contact with me, I don't mind having a chat. There's certainly lots to talk about in the North and Winterfell and everything else still. We'll get some of it covered in Jon's last chapter, especially in terms of the Pink Letter. But for now, let's just focus on the immediate, the emotional reunions, many times over really with Triss and Carl everyone. How they've all come to save Asha and bring her back to life, which is exactly what we want for her. While George actually does definitely confirm that we're going to have to wait this time around. The battle isn't coming. We know it now what wins is going to begin with or what it's going to feature at least. Thus, a brand new type of bridge is built between these books, because like we said earlier on, we've really not got that kind of cliffhanger, that overall big cliffhanger ever before in any of the other books. So this is just huge. It's new ground for us, uh, new ground for George. It's very, very exciting. Now, what I could do here is take another quarter of an hour, 20 minutes to talk about Asher, who we have to say goodbye to for now. But in the interest of giving our other chapters at least a fighting chance of being heard, I won't spend too long on it. In fact, all I'll say is, I'm going to assume she's still going to be of pretty high importance for wins, given where she is, given that we still do need cameras for this big battle. But in terms of dance, well, it is a hell of an arc in general throughout this book, throughout those three chapters. The really, really important three chapters that I really love. I just love Asha as a character. I love the way George writes her chapters. We got such an interesting look at her and her relationships and where she wanted to go in that first chapter back at Deepwood Mott. As well, it was a really cool battle. Then the second, that's the explanation of how bad this march was going, how awful it was for everyone. And then this one here today as well. They're all critical for plot progression, but I do love the focus we get on Asha, especially in that first one, especially when it's her versus the North, her trying to find her place in the world, her still trying to do right by her crew, who she's just been reunited with. So I'm not sure how she quite got through it. It really didn't look like she would. This is a woman who, in this one book, has lost a castle, been captured, gone through a freezing march where she's a prisoner, then sat in a freezing village while everyone talked about burning her. And somehow, she's still here. So my hopes are high for Asher. She's definitely one I hope finds some success at the end, which we can say about a lot of people. But put me right up there on the list of Asher fans. I'm really looking forward to her coming back and wins. <laughs> it's a shame to say goodbye, but that's just what we're going to be doing from now on. We're going to be just saying goodbye to everyone. So get used to everybody. Like I said, this is the end of A Dance of Dragons. But not for this episode. Scraps and Scrolls keeps going. We have another great joy to cover now as we go all the way across the world, nearly as far as you can go, for our second chapter of the day it is Victarion 2, or better known as, confusingly, Victarion 1. Let's focus on that change in chapter title first, because it is pretty interesting. Theon is the only one to have that happen so far, and now Victarion's getting the same treatment, giving this number one chapter after having named title chapters. For Theon, it came after a moment of major introspection and a return to his self. For Victarion, it comes after what seems to be a life-changing moment in his blackened hand and apparent linking to Makoro. So does that signify that he is now finally his true self? Free from Euron forever, perhaps? Or is he under the influence of Makoro forever, and no longer a true Ironborn? Which is what his chapter titles always related to. So we've got a whole bunch of questions right here from the start with no honest answers. But then again, this chapter is only going to add more questions to the pile, so we might as well start off that way if we're going to continue. We move from one Greyjoy, or two really, given that Fionn showed up at the end, to another. It's almost like we're back at the King's Moot, isn't it? But what we have here today now is basically Victarion Unleashed. He's empowered, whether literally or emotionally, and he's going to be turning horror all over the ocean, 
while he travels ever closer to the marine to spread chaos and disrupt everything there. We said the word horror earlier on in the intro, well this is where we're really going to start getting it, as if seeing people burned alive wasn't enough. I won't go too far by way of introduction for this chapter, because we don't really want to talk about Victoria that much anyway, but he is the hardest of today's four chapters to see why it was included. We could have gone without having this chapter entirely, it seems like to us. Obviously we don't have the hindsight, we don't know why it's important, let alone just leaving it until wins. No doubt we will learn one day why we had to see some of this, but not yet. For now, we'll completely clue this. Well, that's true for the majority of leaks. The final scene of the chapter, maybe we can say, oh yeah, we know why we needed to have that involved. But the rest, it seems like it could have been saved or cut. But then again, it does pack a gigantic wallop. It really does get across to us how much Victorian has changed and what he's up to and how bad and evil he is. So maybe George just wanted to add this into his cliffhangers because like I say, there's also a lot of questions to be involved here. So maybe just wants more of those. Because after this, we're going to be guessing about what can actually happen in Marine or with that final scene of the dragon horn or with Victorian himself because we're still not really going to find out. Instead, we'll just get on with it as we meet a true Reaver. We see someone with utter rage. Again, like I say, completely different before. In many ways, we could say this is possibly the chapter of Mokoro rather than Victorian, but I'll let you be the judge as we go through. So we've got a fairly quick turnaround for Victorian's first chapter now. That was only seven chapters ago, so like Cersei, he's having very, very close-knit two-chapter arc. Now you remember the beginning of that chapter was about a stationary Victorian, frustrated over his decision over to whether to move or not, annoyed at his lack of progress, and wanting to actually move to get going. There's no need for any such stagnation this time around though, as George introduces a beautiful landscape painting of a black sea, a silver moon, and a ship on the hunt. It's quite the introduction, trust me. As we mentioned last time, the taking and recruitment of smaller ships is going to be key here and going forward into winds. So we have it as an early focus here, not purely for the logistical, but also to display a Victorian much more back in his element, much more sure of himself now that they are actually moving towards his goal. Then back to what he knows, and that's without whatever mood his new hand and any potential powers that might be imbibed within him which we're reminded of immediately by being told that they found this ship by the grace of Makoro's visions or theories. So we're already assuming that Victorian has completely embraced the priest as was hinted at the end of his last chapter. And that has extended to significant decisions on trusting his nose, so to speak. Do we know if the crew has come around to trusting Makoro now? Does Victorian care any longer or is he still on a fire high and is essentially just removed from reality? We've got a lot of questions about Makoro's uses and apparently considerable powers. We've got them here at the beginning. We're going to have them at the end if I'm being honest with you. And I want to mention another sentence included here by George. He says, like a scar across the sea. There's a really beautiful imagery being given here that we probably wouldn't guess to find normally in Victorian chapters, so I think George is already hinting here just by the use of language, this is something different to what we've had before in this character's chapters. We're also given an update on their progression. We're told we're moving now between the Isle of Cedars and the Astapori Hills, so we're not a whole lot further than last time, but as we expected, we're now moving up the eastern coast of the Isle of Cedars, and then it's pretty much a straight shot to Marine. We've just got to go around the corner and we can almost have it in our sights. So we've got escalation from the beginning. But before that, we have have this chase as Victorian smells blood in the water and even if the prize isn't exactly what he's hoping for in terms of type of ship it is apparently worth the effort so the hunter leaps and it turns out it's like reading a description from a nature show the ironborn are a pack here all wordlessly surrounding their prey and working together to bring it down the trading galley that they're hunting likely knows from the beginning that they're screwed but they still give their best effort and try to make for shelter but all to no avail the hyenas strike the ship's legs are brought down, or oars in this case, and now comes time for fighting. And at the same time, we also get more specific information on where they are as they come very close to the other city on the Isle of Cedars, the northern counterpart to Velos that we detailed in Victorian's last chapter, the one also destroyed by the Doom and left as a haunted ruin, and also the one now giving almost a straight line to Marine. The Iron Fleet is about to round the extended arm of land coming up past Astapor, and then like we say, it's basically an arrow shot. Now, the chase was apparently more interesting than the fight, as the captain of the Giscari Dawn is delivered to Victorian in chains. The man, being from New Geese, is another major marker of how far Victorian has come. Even the type of language the man is speaking is a mystery to him, and therefore is also an annoyance. Yeah, Victorian doesn't seem like he'd be one of the more open-minded, respectful tourists, does he? Luckily, Makoro is on hand to translate, or maybe unluckily if you are this Giscari captain. The man gives an update on Marine that we know is believed by many. He says that Marine is done, Daenerys is dead, and his dar rules. But Victorian, brutal as ever, rips the man's tongue out for the Daenerys part because Makoro says she is not dead, the fires have said so, and he's been right so far. Obviously, this is another clear sign that Victorian is 100% behind whatever Makoro says, whether by enchantment or because he willingly believes it. But it's also kind of a nice reassurance for us. Like we said, Makoro's not been wrong yet, and none of us really expected Danny to have died in this manner, so it's just nice to hear it from a source that maybe does know. Let's enjoy that. Victorian then decides a tongue is not enough and throws the man overboard as a sacrifice to his drowned god. 
And he then says this, Your red god will have his due, he promised Bokoro, but the seas are ruled by the drowned god. So already in our second chapter of the day, we've got yet more sacrifice talk. There's just so much of it at the end of the book. It's another theme of darkness and another one we expect to see so much more of in Winds. is another mark of evil, of bad times. Yeah, that's what Winds is going to be about. So there's an important distinction here. Clearly, Victorian is not entirely bewitched by Makoro. He's not a hapless puppet, even if he is maybe heavily influenced. If he were completely taken, then I doubt Makoro would allow him to still honour the drowned god, whom the priest disparages now. It's going to be very interesting going forward how Victorian can juggle two gods aboard the same ship, and how this is going to be reacted to as well. Will Makoro always allow it, or is he going to put his foot down at some point and demand repayment via total subservience for the saving of Victorian's hand slash life? And then what about the crew? They don't get to hear about the fires or have their limbs saved. They've spent their whole lives in the service of the drowned god, and now they're being told to do the opposite. It's clearly not going to go smoothly. There are going to be bumps along the road. So we have to wonder, has Victorian bitten off more than he can chew then? Will these gods clash in some way and have Victorian have to pay the price? If we had to bet, we'd probably put our money on the red god because we've seen much more of his power than the drowned, but we don't know, do we? We are out on the sea after all. Let's focus in on Makoro now, as we do on the page. He's dressed in black instead of red. Red, black, hmm? Targaryen colours, for what it's worth. And he's basically wearing the uniform of Teen Greyjoy. Victorian has even donated some of his own clothes. Whether there's any power in that as well, that remains to be seen. But it's a very clear sign of acceptance from the captain. This is Victorian going all in on this. He's put him under his wing, and he's endorsed him, and he's saying that Makoro is to be accorded some respect, as well as him trying to make a tactical decision to endear Makoro to the crew, which is actually a pretty smart move considering we're talking about Victorian here. You wouldn't think he would uh, think of such angles. And then again, if we want to talk about clear signs, we're also being told of where Victorian's mind is. He's still enough of himself that he cares what the crew thinks, either because he needs their loyalty, or because such a thing is generally important to him, but he also really cares for or respects Makoro. Whatever happened down in that cabin has persuaded him that Makoro is worthy of respect and even though he might not frame it as such directly maybe even admiration whatever it is he wants the guy around and he wants him to feel respected enough to keep being of use he definitely knows that whatever else we want to talk about Mokoro is worth something so it's a good idea from Victorian but ultimately it's a failed one he ends up making Mokoro even more intimidating than before a walking shadow that the crew absolutely do not like and try to pretend isn't there Oh, I doubt Makoro cares about that at all, but it must still bother Victorian in terms of crew loyalty. Makoro is theoretically of use to get to Marine, but then he still needs his crew to get back home, or wherever else he wants to go. Plus, there must be something, maybe something, resembling fondness for the crew, or at least the closest thing that Victorian can manage. We know he's no Asher in terms of relations to the crew, but still, you'd think he would treasure them in some way. Maybe he is a captain. So we've got tension on how that will all resolve, if it will come to a clash at some point, and it's something else to add to the juggling act that Victorian is up to. And that's an act that he's really choosing to keep going, even with that tension, because like we say, Makoro is simply too valuable. Even if we ignore his saving of the hand, he knows the local geography. He helps them locate these ships. He can predict the weather, which is really crucial. And as always, it just comes back to Euron again. He has wizards, so Victorian wants a wizard. But really, it's the end goal. Victorian wants Daenerys, and Makoro's visions will get a lot closer and a lot faster than not having Makoro will, especially with that weather predicting or the wind building. That really, again, is critical to making the ship go along, isn't it? By way of keeping both sides happy, he instead renames the Giscari Dawn, this captured ship, as the Red God's Wrath for Makoro. His wizard, as he calls him, of course Victorian would see it that way, doesn't seem particularly bothered either way, but you've got to wonder how clueless Victorian actually is in what he's doing. He's told himself that this is all working, that all of them will obey, but we suspect that things are going over his head without him realising because, well, come on, it's Victorian. The fires are cast every night so that Victorian slash Makoro can learn as much as possible. And they might be learning things that are really far down the road still, but for now it's all advantages. They've increased their number of ships to 54. They can work around the weather, and Victorian doesn't have to wait around when a sudden rain drags three of their ships off course. Now, he probably wouldn't wait around anyway, but he's definitely not going to when Makoro is telling him that they'll be fine and not to worry about it. But we are naturally suspicious, of course. Is that true? Is Makoro telling the truth there? Or is he just making sure that he gets to Danny ASAP as well? Or maybe he's subtly having a part in weakening Victorian as well in some way. But for the captain, the ultimate goal is all he sees. He says this, The Iron Captain had no time to wait for laggards, not of his bride encircled by her enemies. The most beautiful woman in the world has urgent need of my axe. Yes, it's got to be the most beautiful woman again. That's the focus, of course, of this guy. But that axe was also mentioned last time in Makoro's visions. So Victorian seems to be putting himself in that role, and maybe he will actually fill it for her somewhere down the road. Maybe he is this massive representative of death coming towards Marine, coming towards the world in general. Maybe in service of Daenerys, maybe against her. We don't know. We could guess, but we don't really know. But either way, I think that does seem like it would fit. Victorian being a bad thing for the world. Yeah, that's not too big of a stretch to make. We have another quote here. 
Victorian could swear that the flames tattooed on his face were dancing too, twisting and bending, melting into one another, their colours changing with every turn of the priest's head. So this seems even more strange and powerful than Minasandra, because this is what Victorian's seeing while Makar is watching his fires. But then he also seems much better at those fires, so maybe he's just a higher grade than Minasandra. But then we also wonder how much of this is for show to keep Victorian interested and respectful until his purpose can be served. We know the show angle from Melisandre, but then again, is that just because she's not as powerful? Maybe Makari's just good enough that he doesn't need a show, maybe it's all true. And we're wondering again what else he can do, because he seems to be able to do quite a bit so far. How will that help Danny? How will he use that against Danny? The questions swirl and swirl. Now the crew, they don't like this sight, obviously, him looking into his fires. It's one thing having him aboard, it's another having to watch him at work. Victorian is trying to curb such thinking, using physical punishment, and it remains to be seen if that will actually work overall, though he does also threaten Makara with a whip should he turn out to be false. So again, there's more resilience in there than we first thought. If we believe Makara would ever allow such a thing to happen, of course, maybe he wouldn't, maybe he's got powers to protect himself, but then maybe he is at risk. We just can't be sure of this guy. We move forward in time now, from beautiful night to dazzling day, as another ship is taken down as prey. This time a cog named Dove, a bird of beauty, and Victorian changes that name to Shrike, which is just about the opposite. And I wonder now if we should be taking note of the various cargo that Victorian is acquiring here, because it does happen quite a lot. All these ships he's capturing have different things. Well, is it all going to be of use later on down the road? Do we need to be dotting these down just in case? Right here and now, he focuses on his discovered treasure of a Murrish lens, which is obviously kind of a telescope. We've seen that before. Apparently, it's something he's never heard of, which strikes me as slightly odd, being a sailor who's at least covered some parts of the world. Remember, Maester Lewin had one of these all the way back up at Winterfell, so how does he know about them, but not a sea captain? Maybe it's just a sign of how removed from society the Ironborn actually are. And just to go along with this thinking, if we were to keep note of the cargo he's acquiring, he's also taking sailors to keep for ransom, so that's something else to remember. But from these lot, he gets no new news, just hints at what we already know, so he can move on pretty quick. When Victorian asks for his daily update on what will happen the next day, he gets all good news. Strong winds to help them on their way. The Tigers slash Volantines being behind them, that's actually good to confirm, we didn't know that before, and Daenerys is in front. And we have this quote, Your Dragon, that's what Daenerys is called. Victorian liked the sound of that. That really does give the impression that maybe he is being played, because he's far too smug and taken with the idea. Is this all a long play by Makaro? We've got to think so. Plus, we know Daenerys isn't there at the moment, but then perhaps the visions mean she'll be back by the time Victorian arrives. That'd be cool. That's definitely what we're hoping for. Makaro makes another guess about yet more prey that they will find. I told you it would come up a lot in this chapter. And he turns out to be right again, and each time it just builds that bridge with Victorian more and more. When these two new ships are eventually brought down as well, there's no treasure this time, but information. They were helping to provide reinforcements to the Discari legions because so many have already died from the Pale Mare. And that's the first time the terrible disease has come up for Victorian, and it's really, really important for him to know because there's few worse places to have a pandemic than a ship. But unfortunately, the captain ignores such news, maybe at his peril. We have to wonder if that's going to come back to haunt him later on. And both captains, both of these captured captains, say that Danny is dead. So he kills them himself, plus their crews, but he saves the slaves, the rowers, and frees them, quote unquote. By which he actually means he transfers their ownership to him, because what they're actually doing is the exact same job, just for a different person. We saw the exact same thing happen in previous Tyrion chapters. And Victorian, he calls it freeing in his own head, and he probably believes his own spin. He also thinks that he killed the captains in Danny's name. He fully believes that he is acting in her interest, that he is one of her people, or worthy of her acknowledgement. He says this, the Dragon Queen free slaves, and so do I, he proclaimed. So really what we've got is full-on delusion at this point. He's already off his rocker. Trust me, it's going to get much, much worse. Because we're actually going to fall into that theme now. As George details just how much Victorian is feeling himself at the moment. He's all into it. He's riding the wave. And he's having the time of his life. He actually sounds like a zealot in some way. He has that touch of just losing connection with reality. His naming his captured ships things like Ghost and Shade. Because, I don't know, he thinks it sounds edgy, I guess. He even makes the zealot comparison for us. When he compares himself to Aaron speaking to the Drown God. So he really is kind of losing it. And you've got to wonder if this is a specific aim or byproduct of whatever Makara is up to. Here's another quote. You shall serve me well, my captain, the way you seem to say. It was for this I made you. Yep, see, he really has gone. Which is probably even more annoying for the poor dusky woman to have to listen to, I imagine. He's really going overboard with his own inflated sense of self-importance, as if he wasn't bad enough in the first place. Two gods are with me now, he told the dusky woman. No foe can stand before two gods. This comes with Victorian giving us his first real reference to the healed arm, quote-unquote. A lot of quote-unquotes for you in this chapter. Despite the fact that the damage has actually spread from his hand all the way up to his elbow, and it looks burned, it splits and cracks, and smoke comes out of it, begging those questions before of what the hell happened in that cabin? What did Makoro do, and how does he have the powers to do it? 
Is it actually healed or is it just delayed? Does it give Victorian some kind of power? Is this critical to Makari's plans or the plans of the Red Priest? And how much does it play into Victorian's new mood? I told you, I warned you, endless, endless questions. If we were to look at his arm, then it still seems thematically linked to Valeria and some of the curses we've heard coming from there, especially if you've read Fire and Blood. Is there a fireworm in Victorian's arm or something? Is it going to spread? Has he got the same thing as Aria Targaryen? What is really going to happen with this thing? Because you absolutely don't write in some terrible burnt arm like you're some kind of medieval cyborg or something, and then not use it. Unfortunately, we're not going to find out in this chapter. The journey continues now as the Iron Fleet comes upon Yaros, an island of Slaver's Bay, and if you'd like to check your maps here, you'll see that they have really moved just within the space of this chapter. They cleared the Astapori arm, and have raced ahead, and have basically covered half of Slaver's Bay already. They only need to go around Yunkai now, and they'll basically be at Marine's doorstep, so their expectations are raised slightly. It's highly unlikely, but first timers might be thinking, are we going to reach Marine in this chapter? Or maybe even this book, we could have another Victorian in it, we might be able to slip a third one in. Either way, we're getting closer. And when they come upon this island, they find the three lost ships are sat there waiting for them. So it's another victory for Makoro, another confirmation for Victorian. But a choice also comes with this arrival. Go through the straits between the Yunkish land and Yaros, or go around Yaros entirely and take much longer, go back out into open sea. The choice is specific for Victorian because of his former defeat to Stannis off a of fair isle along those straits in a similar situation, but there shouldn't be anyone expecting or prepared for the Iron Fleet, and time is of the essence, and though those are perfectly good reasons, it's actually comparing himself to Euron again that finally pushes Victorian into the straits. On the other side of Yaros, it's ship taking time once more. We find another three with bunches of more treasures and cargo, even if Victorian does lose two of his own ships in fighting fishermen. And that's sure to put him in a bad mood, he doesn't like that. And this time the news that they bring is different. Now it is not that Danny is dead, but it's the first news of Drogon and his involvement of it all, and the fact that Danny has supposedly escaped upon him. Where is this Dothraki sea? he demanded. I will sail the Iron Fleet across it and find the Queen wherever she may be. The fisherman laughed aloud. And to be honest, so do we. Now we shouldn't laugh, really, he's not to know, but come on, it is Victorian, he deserves to be laughed at. Besides, it's a good reminder of how out of his depth he is. Unfortunately, these two captains who do laugh at him pay for it immediately, as Victorian uses his dragon arm, his firearm, whatever you want to call it, to pick one up and slam him into the mass, choking him to death. And that's no mean feat to pick up a grown man with one hand and strangle him. And I'm going to guess Victorian wasn't able to do that before Makoro got hold of him. So the questions come again. Does Victorian have some kind of superpower now? Is he like super strong? We don't know. After killing the man and chucking him in the sea, Makoro perhaps gets a bit daring by not only speaking out against the drowned god, but calling him a fool to the great other. Now I doubt Victorian cares about that last part, but the word fool is insulting enough. Yet Victorian focuses on the belief of the crew of his warning, citing them as dangers who will protect their beloved drowned god. He doesn't talk about his own faith, we should probably note that. Besides, he says he is honouring both, so there's no cause for complaint, and Makoro agrees. He's not worried, he's seen the fate of Victorian, and according to him, he is a glory worthy of the Lord of Light, which Victorian obviously loves to hear because it sounds great for him. He's backing his own horse, and he's too stupid to maybe try and see that if there's any hidden context. Why challenge it if it means good things for him? But we can be a bit more critical, because we know what glory, quote-unquote, and worth, quote-unquote, can mean to the Red Priests. Something such as, say, burning, burning alive, can be framed as in service to a law. So this really means nothing definite, but we could easily see it being the opposite to what Victorian thinks. Him not sensing the danger behind these supposed gifts. And narratively, it's just going way too well for him, so we think, hmm, a downfall at some point is pretty likely. He is dealing with fanatics, it must be remembered. He can't see that because they are giving him too much of what he likes, and maybe he's being influenced by the arm as well, but he can be easily tricked, or Mokoro can genuinely think that everyone would want to die or burn in the service of his god. He's pretty far gone himself, don't forget. Maybe it is specifically hinting that Victorian will burn one day, not just have a downfall, but be burned. Now that'd be a turnaround when George has just suggested that Asher will do that instead, so that makes for great chapter sequencing. Obviously, none of that gets through to Victorian, who's too busy flying away on his own Cloud Nine, repeating his confidence over and over to the Dusky Woman, and this time we actually get some indication of what he wants to do after claiming Daenerys, which he really didn't fill us in on last time. That's pretty much what you'd expect. Power, dominion, the usuals. He wants to go back to the Iron Islands, bring back the old way, and become the greatest of them all in terms of terrorising Westeros. He wants to beat out Dagon Greyjoy, whom he details a little bit here. That guy came up short against the dragons, but Victorian will be the first of them to use dragons, and therefore he thinks will become unbeatable. He even almost acts like the whole thing was his idea, he's just forgetting Euron's part in it entirely. And of course, this includes that claiming of Daenerys and the bearing of children with her, which makes us disgusted to even think about. But then again, we're fairly sure that isn't going to happen, or at least we really hope not. No thank you, George. 
On the journey goes, with the Iron Fleet still swelling. Now they are sailing the stretch between Yunkai and Marine, so obviously everything gets a bit busier, a bit more dangerous. There's warships about, there's supply ships. It'll be a busy lane, and Victorian has to step it up in terms of both not being slowed and not being told tales of. They don't want to spread the news. So they head out further from the coast, but there's still hunting to be done. And you'll note here that George is painting a picture of the sea and the sky every time that Victorian goes on the hunt. It's a structure type that we're used to seeing, these repeated reminders. Normally they come in threes. We even have a similar thing within this same chapter with the constant count of how many ships there are. That's a technique we've seen lots of times from George. This hunt goes a little differently. Firstly, because the Iron Victory is directly involved, but also because the ship they are hunting is a slaver, full of young boys and girls being sent off to lease and its pleasure houses. I don't like saying those words, it's just a sickening feeling all round, especially when we remember recent conversations about Jane. Fuck you, Peter Baelish, we've got to put that in there. It's awful that this is still going on, even after Danny's best efforts, but we can see what she was trying to end, and we hope that that time will eventually come again. For now, once the ships are captured, Victorian kills the slavers because he hates the slavers. Okay, that's good, we like that. We discussed before, he doesn't like slavery, so yep, thumbs up. The slaves who are rowing follow the same road as before. You get to row for me now, and you should be thankful. That's not so nice. And then he repeats that with some of the slave girls, dividing them among the captains and changing their label to fools instead of slaves, and telling them to thank him for such a gift. And like we said last time in his last chapter, I very much doubt the change is of any distinction to these poor victims. I'm not sure they care what label they're getting, just what they're being made to do. Now you'd think that would be bad enough, wouldn't you, dividing these people up between his captains. But no, we have further horror for this chapter yet. Because the boys, they are simply chained and thrown into the sea to drown, contempted as unnatural creatures, and basically Victorian says, good riddance. It's another offering to the drowned god. It's another sickening reminder of who Victorian is. We might laugh at him in this chapter, or be really interested in his multiple questions and the future of his plot, but we mustn't forget that he is one of the most evil POVs we have. He's a villain, make no mistake. And you'd think that was the worst it would get, wouldn't you? But... No, again, we get worse. Because Victorian takes seven girls for himself, whom he details in a rather horrible fashion that I'm not going to repeat. And at first we're worried that we're going to have to witness Victorian giving himself the present of seven young girls in the same way that he does the dusky woman. And boy, would that be a tough passage to read. But actually he has something equally horrifying in mind. While giving his crew a motivational speech on how it's going to become that much harder as they enter the war zone that is Marine, with ships from all her enemies swirling around, Victorian instills a sense of superiority, reminding his men that they are fighting mere slavers, and that they alone are true warriors, they are ironborn, and are better than everyone else. We will seize their ships, smash their hopes, and turn their bay to blood. Okay, that's all very good, and it has the intended effect on the crew and their motivation. Although let's note that it leaves out the fact that they are being chased by a gigantic fleet of volunteer soldiers. 500 ships, don't forget. And I hadn't actually realised that he'd been keeping that a secret. He must be convinced that the crew would turn against him if they found out or not dare to risk a fight against such a force. And you've got to think that decision of secrecy is going to bite him in the ass at some point in the future. And we look forward to it. By way of celebrating this speech comes one of the darker moments of this book, which is really saying something, I think you'll agree. It doesn't really get highlighted as much as some others, but, well, I'm struggling to think of another word on top of sickening. I should look up my synonyms, really. But I think that gets across the message, as he calls these seven slave girls that he selected earlier forward, he puts them aboard a fishing catch, and he cuts the ship loose before setting it on fire. And there's something about the writing style of that sentence where George actually tells us that. The straightforwardness of it, the coldness of it from George, that just makes it all the worse. It's definitely one that you have to read back a few times to make sure you actually got it right, but unfortunately we did. So it turns out this is the chapter of a sacrifice, and it's an even worse one than what we saw last time. Again, the high frequency of this theme is just everywhere. And what about what came before it, before these girls went aboard this ship? Victorian kissed each of them as he put them aboard. He told them that they were being honoured, and then he killed them in one of the most brutal ways possible, this combination of burning and drowning. The irony in this is obvious to everyone except Victorian. He told someone of worth and glory and service before killing them. Mokoro keeps telling Victorian of worth and glory and service, and yet Victorian can't put two and two together. On top of that, it's Victorian who leads the chant this time, the sermon as these poor girls suffer through a horrific death that I don't want to imagine. And he paints it as a good thing for them, either sending them to be reborn in the light or to dance with the drowned god beneath the waves. To him, it's the best of both worlds. So again, I'm going to say it, the guy has lost it. He's insane. Although just to solidify that idea, he even starts hearing their terrified screams as joyous song. Insanity. That's the only way to put it. He's completely gone. And whether Victorian believes the words of his sermon, or is just continuing to ride the wave, or if this has more influenced Macquarie than is apparent, a corner has clearly, clearly been turned. This is not the Victorian of before, not at all. 
his fanaticism, his delusion, and his danger all on another level entirely. And again, we've got to think this is going to lead to something truly, truly bad for someone, or probably a lot of people. And worst of all, whether by coincidence or by actual power, after this burning, this sacrifice, a wind does come up and keeps carrying them on towards Marine. He thinks this, On wings of song I fly to you, Daenerys. Ugh. I mean, delusion. Sickliness. What is happening to this guy? It's just, it can't, you can't properly quantify it. It's just awful. It gets right into his skin. It's creepy, is what it is. And the chapter ends now with an all too short scene focused on Dragonbinder, the horn of Eurons once sounded at the King's Moon. This is the first time that Victorian is brought out, and for all we know, maybe this is what Makoro has been waiting for. Maybe it's what he wanted to get close to, and what the flames have really been directing him to. That'd make sense, wouldn't it, in terms of gaining power and influence over Daenerys, you could see why he'd want it. And after a brilliant description of the horn, don't forget, it's banded with Valerian steel, it's pretty cool, and its magical glyphs, Makoro first names it, and then gets Victorian remembering when he heard its sound. Its call was fire in the chest, a burning of the soul, and a thousand screams melted into one. It's powerful, is the only way to put it. But on top of that, we learn the information that the hornblower from the King's Moot, a gigantic and muscular man, died after sounding it, and that his insides were all burned up. So again, it's powerful, it's got us interested. Makoro confirms the tale with the horn's message on mortal men. At first, Victorian thinks it is another poison gift, until the priest explains that you don't have to sound it yourself, but with someone who is bound to you by blood. And that is what Victorian must do to earn the dragons. And that is our ending note for the chapter. And what an ending, because it really has us guessing for any kind of clue, and it's pretty damn dire, isn't it? Now let's break it down just a little bit. We won't spend too long on this. But firstly, it says dragons, plural. This horn can bind dragons to you. Not one, maybe two, maybe three. So that's worrying enough, but let's move past that. What about this binding of blood? Did Euron hope that Victorian wouldn't find this out, would sound the horn himself, thinking that he would gain control of the dragons, but would actually bind them back to Euron miles away instead? Does that fit? Does it work that far? Is, what's the range on this horn? What's the range of the enchantment being put on the dragons? We don't know. And is that binding between you and Victorian just by the fact that they're related by blood? Or has Euron done something extra to put Victorian into his service? It seems likely that I think that's a good idea to focus on, but we don't really know. Like so much else in this chapter, we are just purely guessing at all points. And what will actually happen? What will actually come of, with this spawn? Well, lots of people talk about Euron getting one. Will Victorian get one for himself? We don't see that mentioned as much just because I think he's just too stupid to imagine him with one. What about Makaro and the Red Priest? Will they get one of them for their own use? Or will they use this to coerce Danny? Do what we want or we'll take your dragons and do it for you? That kind of thing. This is something else we've discussed uh, at length throughout really. So I won't repeat it too much for you here. There's lots and lots of ideas. Again, this is the ending of a plot thread. This is the ending of a POV. There's just questions here, there and everywhere for all of these chapters today. We could just do a whole new podcast just on the cliffhangers and questions. But for now, it's a goodbye to Victorian. While our minds are swirling with what a horn that controls dragons could do, both here, back in Westeros, for the overall plot, for defeating the others, they're all going to remain in our heads. But let's say goodbye for now. I'm not a fan of Victorian or his chapters in general, but you can't deny that this is a quality cliffhanger. Because not only do we have dozens of questions about the horn, but everything else as well. There's the arm still, there's Makoro, there's what Victorian's actually planning to do in Marine. What will actually happen, because we're pretty sure his plan isn't going to come off. I mean, it's just everywhere, isn't it? Who is the dusky woman? Is there a connection back to Euron? We've got loads. Is it, I mean, we, do, we do for all these chapters, so that's fair enough. But this one specifically, it's just so weird and odd and dark. Now that fits the theme of the ending of this book and what we're going to get to in wins. Yeah, I still find it placed rather oddly and maybe not needed overall, but George must be showing it to us for a reason. And if it's nothing more than just wanting to get us really, really interested for wins, as if he needs any help with that, then hey, it's a success. Because like I say, questions everywhere. The main message of the chapter, I think, is Victorian is gone. He's off his rocker more so than before. And he absolutely represents danger to everyone because this, this is really not the type of thinking we need to add into the mirror he's not, but apparently we're going to. So maybe that is it. Maybe that's just the whole purpose. Just to make us view Marine a bit different because we know there's still more to come even with whatever we get from Tyrion and Barry and Quentin but lucky us no more Victorian for this book yes he only appeared briefly but he's still annoying so goodbye Victorian we'll unfortunately probably see you another time but not here on the aisle because we are moving to our third chapter of the day one of even more horror if you can get your head around that in Aya 2 slash the ugly little girl let's head to Bravos right now so lucky us, we move from a character we hate having to talk about to one we love talking about. And yet what I'll say at the beginning here will sound like it's making out the two chapters to be similar, but it's actually not. What I'll say is out of the four we have today, this one is probably the, the most removable of all of our chapters. 
the least involved of the rest of dance. Okay, now that sounds similar to what I said about Victorian at the end, why we really didn't get why it was included, but it's not. What I'm talking about is plot, because Victorian is at least related to other things in the book, like Asher. Those two have adopted more dance-focused storylines. Victorian's chapter could be removed because the plot progression doesn't seem to be anything that we need, that we absolutely need so far. Now, I'm sure we'll find out different later, but just based on what we have, I'm saying that we could have done without it. That's not true for this one. We absolutely do need what we have in this chapter, but you could take it out of the book and you wouldn't know, would you? That is, that's what I'm saying. That's my point. The two Greyjoys, more closely directed with dance, like we said right back at the beginning. Asher and Cersei, much less so, but Cersei, because she's in King's Landing, which just affects more people, even though it's still a bubble within dance, that's not a dance with dragons place King's Landing, it is more connected overall. So that one seems like it has to stay a bit more, plus they do talk about John Connington a little bit, so it's got that connection, whereas Aya in Bravos is completely separate from the rest of dance. So this one could have been plucked out and we'd, we'd never know, would we? We wouldn't know this is missing. So George must have a really strong reason to include her beyond just keeping up the streak of eye being in every book, which is a cool little trivia fact. Although we've already had her once, so that's already settled, but still, why has he included this one? Like we discussed with Cersei last time, George obviously needs some characters set up and at a certain point to start the Winds of Winter. With Cersei, it's her being out of jail and approaching the trial with her new monster. We're going to cover that in a second. Well, in a while, probably. For Aya, it's her being at the beginning of her mission with Isambaro and the significant barrier of face swapping already having been established. So that's what we're going to get today. Now, it's a bit easier with Cersei to see why we need that point now and how it will fit into the larger plot. But while we lack details for Aya, say for her preview chapter, we know the beginning of the path back must start at some point and we can assume that there'll be something big to do beforehand, something that will probably require the magic of face swapping, hence why George slots it into this book so she can hit the ground running with her mercy chapter, Come Wins. That, plus it's just the idea of horror again that we're really going to explore again as another preview for the Winds of Winter and another sense of completion for Aya to end the book. She's always moving on to new situations at the end of each book. Last time, it was with failure. She became blind. This time, it will be of a huge success, even if it is one that we really do have to wonder about. This inclusion is also just George letting us peer into the shadow. It's a kind of a treat, really, after this long, tough book. And it's probably one of our biggest awaited reveals for the ending that we get, to be honest. We have surprises throughout, sure. But in terms of what we've been asking about for ages in Aya's Bravos plot, what they get up to in the temple, what the big secrets are, and how that might relate to Aya, well, we actually do get to find some of that today. And let's talk about the face swapping thing, shall we? Because, well, what the hell are we dealing with here? This is pretty much entirely different from anything else we ever see in the series. I'm serious for that. It's an organised, near industrialised form of magic, clearly understood and being put to use. This isn't just one random wizard doing some weird trick out somewhere in the wild. This is a institution. This is a form of production that they've got going on here. That organised side of it is unique enough. But then what about what they are actually physically doing? This ability to put on an old human face on someone else and then you not only take on their appearance, which is magical and weird enough, you'd have their memories of their life and their emotions from beforehand and then you can take it off and be you again. Now, we've known about the existence of face swapping for ages now, but this just still massively seems like out of the blue because what the hell? How does it work? What is it? We don't understand. What is the basis for how it actually physically works? What are the hints and the preparation? We've really had none of that especially in terms of the memory of flesh and the transference of emotion. At least we knew about the swapping appearance thing, but that is completely new to us in this chapter. So in a way, this is really our best ever look at organised magic, definitely of this kind anyway. Yes, we have everything with Bran and Warging and the North, plus you know the dragons, but that all feels like a different category to me. That's all something much more based in nature and kind of central to the world, to this song. What we see today is, is separate. It's something manipulated and taken advantage of, and well, we just don't really know how to explain it, do we? But once we realise that's what this chapter is going to be about, oh, do we get hungry? Oh, do we want to find out? Because it's weird, it's creepy, and it obviously brings so many possibilities for it, for the plot in general, but for Aya specifically. So we really, really want to see what's going on here. So let's jump into the actual text, where we find that we've got another ceremony of a type right here at the beginning. It seems like those are everywhere today. We've had two different types of sacrifice already. Now we've got another type that we've obviously got no idea about. And it seems like it's a moment of high importance. This gathering of secret servants that, again, we know nothing about. This is more than I has ever seen before. Um, we've got some of them coming out of their secret ways and tunnels and stuff like that. So we know this is a behind-the-curtain moment already. We're going to get way, way more of that in this chapter. But here we go with it at the start. We finished that last chapter of Victorian with 
so many questions, so George decides to now transport us to one of the most question-filled places in the series, this temple of secrets and shadows, and again, questions, questions everywhere, we don't know what's going on. So that sense of discovery and reveal and progression for Aya, we're hitting that up right at the beginning so that we know what's coming through the rest of the chapter. And that's just from the knowledge that we're at this meeting, that Aya gets to be included in such an important time. But then we're told that these 11 servants, when they've come out of their secret tunnels, are all wearing faces that are not their own. So wow, that sets the theme and the focus of the chapter first off, but it definitely gets us intrigued as well. What is it that we're about to see? And what are we and Aya about to learn? Because again, we've got those questions. And before we go any further, let's note that they're sitting on weirwood chairs, which is always so interesting, or at least half weirwood chairs anyway. Some of them have the faces, even if they're not proper weirwood faces, so we can expect no powers of these, but it just adds into the general aesthetic of creepiness and hidden powers that we don't understand. That's what the weirwoods represent to us, as well as just being a nice reminder of who Aya is. Even here, halfway across the world, while learning how to truly be someone else, Aya has her home and her bloodline there to remind her in the form of some chairs. So we remember from her last chapter that she'd earned herself a little bit of a promotion and that is to serve the water at this top secret, probably very important meeting. And she does it stock still. She's just part of the background here. She makes no noise. But obviously there is something that her teachers or this school believe can be of value for her and the other acolyte who's also there. If there's anything to really be secretive about that she wasn't supposed to learn, they'd probably just get their own drinks for us, wouldn't they? Then again, we've seen how Tyrion used this role to gather his own information before putting it to use back in the camp of Yezan. And we've talked about similar with the Kingsguard lots of times. Even the Dusky Woman, in a way. These people who are there in the background can be very, very important. So perhaps Aya can do the same. Maybe she can learn something, and maybe we can as well. Either way, we're keen to see what the meeting holds. But then it seems to be over almost as soon as it begins. It's a delegation meeting, really. It's just, it's just deciding which of the servants will kill which target. So I'm sure, that is interesting, very much so, to see how they do things and how they divvy up the clients, etc. But we were probably hoping for a bit more. Now they use different languages, which reminds us that Aya is slowly learning different languages, although she cannot always hear what they are actually saying because of their lowered voices. And given that her hearing is supposed to have increased of late, thanks to her last chapter, you'd think that they are using similar skills to lower their voice even more than normally possible. So that's another one to add to the faceless man's skill set that we can use out in the field. They've just got all these creepy kind of pseudo powers, they're kind of powers, they're kind of not, who knows. We are left wondering what they might have been arguing about or what they didn't want overheard because there's a little bit of a heated part of this meeting. Maybe that was about the overall strategy of the club and what clients they're going to take or whatever. We don't know, unfortunately. There's big things happening out in the world. Maybe they're deliberating on what side they want to come down on or what they're going to do overall. That would be very, very interesting to learn, but unfortunately not for this time. So already this big important meeting that we've built up at the beginning ends and the servants leave aside from the two that we're best associated with and then one new one. A man with a face mocked by the plague, a face of sores and blood and ugliness. And he's the one who wants to talk to Aya, so our interest is piqued again. That's absolutely fine, Aya, she doesn't mind. She's seen far worse than sores. And it turns out the plague man wants to ask the same question that the kindly man does. Who are you? And once he does, we get the sense that this is another test of sorts, another barrier for Aya to cross. She replies in the expected way, and the conversation stays the same as if she were talking to the kindly man, when she's told that she is still Aya Stark, no matter what she claims. So here at the beginning, we're wondering about why it's the plague man now asking instead of the kindly man. What's the difference? If the conversation is just going to be exactly the same, then why bother? The plague man names her a liar and asks why she's here. And this time we get a slightly different answer. When that question has come before, it's normally been related to the idea that she has nowhere else in the world to go. But that doesn't come up this time. Instead, she says, to serve, to learn, to change my face. Obviously, it's the end of that quote that sticks out to us. Aya is enraptured with this mystical ability and she wants to make use of it. In a way, though, this is what gives her away, as the plague man accuses her of the fact that if she wants to change her face, if she has that desire, there must be a reason behind that. She must want to kill for her own purposes. She must want to use it for revenge, as we all secretly hope and figure that she eventually will. We hope it of two sides, really. Firstly, we'd just like to see some people get revenged upon, and also because that would mean the person that is Aya Stark still remains and isn't wiped away completely, even if the seeking and corruption of revenge might not be exactly what we want for her, although we also kind of do. It's difficult, isn't it? Luckily for us, Aya confirms that is exactly what she wants when she bites her lip, a clear sign that's been pointed out to us in her feast and dance storylines and before as well. And luckily for Aya though, that earns her a stinging slap across the face, which we obviously don't want to see, but Aya's actually happy about it because she doesn't want to bite her lip. She doesn't want to have any tells, and it's her opinion that if physical pain breaks that habit, 
and physical pain is what she needs. That's how dedicated to the core she is, that's how perfect she wants to become. She is still determined to become the Night Wolf instead of Aya, clearly not having figured out that the two are actually entwined. You can't call yourself a wolf while trying to forget you're a Stark Aya, it doesn't work that way does it? But she is stubborn, we know that, so she keeps on denying that she has a personal interest in this. But the Plague Man is good, he knows the truth, and always seems to summon the thought of her list from her mind. It appears again, just like it did in her first chapter. It's still not going anywhere, which we kind of like and don't like at the same time. But she does manage to keep silent this time though. The Plague Man says she was a cat, and for a second, we worry that they've figured out her secret gift, think back to her first chapter in this book. But he's actually talking about her life as Cat of the Canals, a comfy life, better than many people get. And as I admitted to us, it's basically the best time she's ever had since the fall of her father. And the Plague Man, he senses it, and he's playing on that now, as he offers the return of that life. And let's be fair, it's not a bad option to take. It's certainly easier than what the temple holds. Already, and she doesn't even know the truth of it all yet. But that is the last thing that Aya actually wants. Both for the surface reasons of never letting herself be beaten, she's too competitive, but of wanting to prove herself, for wanting to get away from the pain and protect herself by becoming the Night Wolf instead of Aya Stark with all her tragedy, but also for the under reason of teaching her how to kill. Your heart is too soft to be one of us. He means to send me away, I thought. I have no heart. I only have a hole. I've killed lots of people. I could kill you if I wanted. Oh, uh, well, it's a cool line, but we don't want to hear it, do we? We don't want to hear that she only has a hole where her heart used to be, although we did discuss that idea. I can't remember if it was either Feast or Storm, but she's talking about the aftermath of the Red Wedding. Knowing her family was dead, she said something about having a hole where her heart was supposed to be, I'm sure of it. But it's still the last thing we want to hear, even if it is super understandable, given all she's been through. Luckily, we think she's wrong anyway. What is clear from this sentence is that George is still making sure to frame her as the child she is, which is a really difficult thing to do, considering the setting she's in, the things she's learning and who she's becoming but he manages it with sentences like this where it's clear she can't quite figure out what the deal is what she's supposed to be saying and what would have worked with the plague man she's more literal and straightforward as children tend to be such as the affirmation that she could kill the plague man and not knowing the answer over whether she should find that sweet or not we can see what the answer is supposed to be what they want to hear this blanking of the slate but i can't just yet the plague man gives the same speech that the kindly man does about what the temple is all about not killing for money or pride or anything like that they serve the god of many faces and no more so they claim well, we have the same issues with that that we always have. The charging an awful lot, the choosing which clients do die, and the problem of just letting others choose in the first place, and those with considerable wealth as well. So, well, we've talked about that lots of times, how hypocritical it is, it doesn't really make sense, but we won't bog ourselves down with that argument again. Instead, we'll have another quote. A servant must be humble and obedient. I obey. I can be humbler than anyone. So that's honestly just a bit of a heartwarming right there. It's a sweet line, it's a funny line, and it's one that supports what we just said about Aya still being very young and not being world knowledgeable, all things considered. Even the Plague Man likes it, but he still has to make clear what we're actually talking about here, because it's not supposed to be fun and Aya being endearing isn't enough. We've heard versions of what he says next from the Kindly Man, but this one seems to be a little bit stronger. It gives that impression of the barrier again, a crossing may be coming up, because why else would he be saying it? But it also just hits us hard, yet again, of what Aya is actually offering, what she's risking to lose here. I'll read it to you at length. The price is you. The price is all you have, and all you ever hope to have. We took your eyes and gave them back. Next we will take your ears and you will walk in silence. You will give us your legs and cruel. You will be no one's daughter, no one's wife, no one's mother. Your name will be a lie and the very face you wear will not be your own. So again, it sounds cool. That's a cool way to say it, but no, no thank you. That is not what we want. We aren't willing to give up Aya, our Aya as we know her. Not to get back a servant of the many faced God and not even to get a cool revenge ninja. But then this has been brought up before and it hasn't worked yet, so... That's okay, maybe it just won't. There's also hints about what is still to come. We know Aya was accelerated to the losing your eyes part of the learning process as punishment for killing Darian and an extra effort to break her early. But apparently, being made deaf and then crippled are also further down the line, should she stay here and continue to learn. Now if I had to bet, I would say George is mentioning those now because we'll never actually get to see them. He was able to recover a lot from the scrap of the five year gap, but not everything. Some stuff has just got to go. Surely we're not going to have time to see those two learning techniques implemented as well. Now, I've got lots of theories and ire leaving this plot line during wins and finally heading back to westeros whether from something to do with mercy and that taste of revenge that she gets or possibly even running into jane we've heard that theory as well but actually seeing her being deaf and crippled i just think it would be too repetitive for narrative purposes and george just has zero room for repeats like we say finally at the end of that quote we're hinted at how close Aya is to being able to swap faces and that does worry us because there must be a cost for such things and it might affect her sense of self but it's also undeniably intriguing for what she could do with such a thing such a power and Aya is intrigued too she reflects on what she'd be giving up all the names she has worn including her original and she decides it's worth it i can pay the price give me a face
That's pretty thrilling, we gotta admit. So the Plague Man lays out how she can earn such a thing. She must make her first kill, or maybe her first ordained kill, rather. And though I'm not sure Aya really gets it in the moment, what the Plague Man is trying to get across here is that this will be different to all the deaths that she's dealt before. This one won't be revenge, or for the purposes of escape, or safety, or anything like that. It's not going to come in anger, or in the passion of the moment. As far as she knows, there'll be no purpose. This person could be completely innocent, a member of the public. And the question is, can she still kill them? Because that is something very different to the passion or justice that she's used to kill before. And he wouldn't actually frame it in this way, but he's asking Aya to actually commit murder this time, so the big difference. But as I say, I don't think that sinks in for Aya at this stage, because without hesitation, she accepts. So the test is set. Plague Man says, let's see what you've got, and she is sent back out to the life of Cat of the Canals, back to every aspect of it, and given the task of killing a random man. Back to every aspect of it, and given the task of killing a random man as well. She fits back in seamlessly and gets on with doing reconnaissance on the man who she finds immediately using her old cover of the girl with the barrow. He is a man of 50 years and even that incites a certain thought within her. He has lived too long, she tried to tell herself. Why should he have so many years when my father had so few? But the cat of the canals had no father, so she kept that thought to herself. What it tells us is that the plan for Aya to lose all identity ain't happening. And we say that every R chapter because it's just so clear. We already know it. I've said it a bunch of times, but it's always nice to have the reminder. And there's two pieces of evidence for that. The first sentence is her trying to rationalise, to tell herself it's okay for this person to die because he's old. So she's battling with the morality of it when she's just been told that's not supposed to enter into the equation. But the larger roadblock is obviously the reference to Ned. His early death still hurts her. Well, duh, of course it does. But she's not going to let go of that anytime soon. And even though we might want her to heal and move on, of course, we also don't want her to just forget and move away completely. Her descriptions of the man go further as she tries to smile at him but only gets a scowl back. That trick will not work this time. So she decides she doesn't like him there and then and lets all further description of him fill in her own narrative which winds up with her telling the kindly man that the target is an evil man. And again, the kindly man has to make the point that it's not supposed to matter if he's evil or not. That is not the place of their order or their god. It doesn't matter. It's not important. So there you go. Yet more evidence that Aya is not fully into it. And the thing is that it's really really obvious i think that she's just not fitting it's just never going to happen so we have to ask the question why does the temple keep letting that slide why do they keep throwing her out there why do they eventually give her a face when it's clear on every level that she is not no one is it just expected at this level and they don't normally have people truly becoming no one until later in the process Maybe, but it doesn't seem that likely, not at the face-giving out stage anyway. Do they just really need a child for some big job in the future, and are therefore fast-tracking her and cutting corners? Do they plan to use her actual identity as a Stark in some way? Could be. Or could they even know of the warging ability and plan to use that as well? That would certainly be a twist. We really don't know at this point, it could be anything, but it's just something to think on. I just think we need to keep the overall targets of the faceless men as an institution in the back of our minds, because we've got to figure they're going to have some big influence at some point, and I am might be involved. She continues intel gathering and continues to dislike the target, even while perhaps unknowingly trying to reassure herself that some good will come of this, even from the man himself, that he might thank her for it. At the same time, the kindly man adds on the extra task of the man never taking any knowledge of her at all, just to make it all the more difficult. In this part of the chapter, I think George is perhaps guilty of some of the overwriting that I believe we get in some of the Aya chapters, as we're taken around Bravos again and given all these extra details. The man just likes writing about Bravos. We can't knock him because, hey, he's good at it and we like to read it, but but sometimes I think that can be true. Either way, Aya slowly learns that the man is essentially a crooked insurance salesman. He writes the binders for ships such as we covered earlier in Tyrion's arc with the widow on the waterfront. And the kindly man fills in the gaps for us about how at least some of the time this man refuses to pay out. Perhaps when a sailor dies and his wife has no one to intimidate the man with. Aya pieces that part together herself. That this is a revenge killing, it's just not revenge for her. And that makes it much more familiar, much more acceptable to her. During the watching, she also notes the tiny details that separate her kind from any other. In this case, it's the biting of the coins. And there's absolutely no way that you catch that on your first read, so don't tell me you did. It's just really clever by George in terms of laying the evidence out for us to come back and find later on. So we, as rereaders, know to keep that note in our mind for later. When she later lets slip that she's thinking of such reasoning of why someone wants him dead, she's reminded yet again that you're not supposed to be thinking that way, and she's again offered another out. No harm, no foul, just say the word, but Aya refuses. She's the same as she ever was, right from when we met her. She won't give up on any circumstance, especially when facing some kind of task that she's been told she can't do. That's original Aya, right there. So, we've done the establishment of the target. 
Now we need an actual plan, a way to kill him, which is also left for Aya to figure out on her own, of course. First, she smartly sets up the barriers. The guy has two guards who never leave his side at any time, and one who tests his suit for him. He suspects that someone is taking revenge on him, maybe because of a specific case, or maybe because he scams so many people that it's bound to happen at some point. So traditional means are not going to be an option. Aya needs to think outside the box here. She only realises that after another conversation with the kindly man, who shoots down the questionable idea of waiting until the target and his smaller guard are left on their own, and then she can just go up and kill them. Simple. But no, that's not the way. Firstly, there is one target and one target only, which again raises some very interesting questions about the faceless man philosophy on collateral damage. We're thinking about the doom maybe, and all the people who died as a result of that, but also just the implications of killing this important person or the other important person. That can affect wars and plots and countries. Lots of people can die as a result of one person being assassinated. So do they take that into consideration? Or do they, much more likely, consider everything out of their actual hands fair game? As long as you don't personally kill someone else, what happens after isn't up to us. You'd think that'd be their approach. Plus they already said that she is not supposed to be noticed. This task isn't about her ability to kill two men. It's if she can do it without ever being thought of as a possibility. That's the difference. That's what makes a faceless man. So we've built it up to be stupid hard, and that means we expect something cool to turn out to be the solution, and it builds up our expectation at the same time. Aya thinks she understood. Kill him. Kill only him. It definitely gets us going, it gets us in that mood, and George catalyzes on that with the next paragraph, announcing at its start date that after three more days of watching, she does indeed find a way. So that's a great tactic to get us to read on, because readers and viewers always love the solving of a problem or a riddle, and classic George, he gives us just enough of a hint to start our minds going each way, when we're told it's something to do with a finger knife. Obviously our first thought is it's going to be some sleight of hand to cut the man's throat or his wrist or something. But either way, we are intrigued and we're really buying into this chapter now, we're involved. But we're told quite quickly it's not skin she will slice, but material, as she remembers the lessons of Red Rogo about how to be a cut purse, the smoothest and the quickness required. Personally, it makes me think of the Gentleman Bastard sequence, that most wonderful set of books I always like to talk about, but we know it's got something to do with that, and she hints it's something to do with the waif as well, but we still don't actually know the plan, hence we keep on reading. We want to know the source of Aya's confidence as she tells the kindly man it's a done deal. She will complete the job on the very next day. To which the kindly man responds and in one fell swoop completely knocks the idea of the plan out of our heads. It's a superb George switcheroo getting us all worked up by one thing only to replace it with something infinitely more interesting. Cat of the canals is known to many. If she has seemed to have done this deed it might bring down trouble on Brusco and his daughters. It is time you had another face. Oh, whoa. This is the big time, this is happening. We knew it has already been presented as a big part of the chapter, and has already been set up as a further goal that Ira is supposed to be attaining with this kill, but did we expect it to actually come so soon? I doubt it, and this is undeniably a huge step into the unknown, into the darkest and most un-understandable magic that we have no idea about. So at the same time, we're incredibly interested to see this frankly amazing power and how it all works, the secrets behind it, while also worrying what it means for Aya. Is this something that you can come back from? Is your face ever truly your own after this? We don't know. When we have so many conversations on identity within these books, this one specifically has dealt a lot with the idea of names, a conundrum easily applicable to Aya, now you're adding the fact that you can actually swap faces. What's that going to do to a person's mental state or self-identity? But to be honest, curiosity most likely wins out for us all. This is a place with a deep, dark secret. One that's been set up over the four previous Aya chapters. And now we have a chance to discover what it is. What lies in the shadow. What gives these killers such an advantage over the world. How it works. What you can do with it. What you can't do with it. And if we're honest, what this might mean for the plot. Because potentially, it could mean just about anything, really, couldn't it? There are a few other markers that open more doors than this in terms of where Aya can go, what she can do. This just throws it all wide open, and it's nothing short of thrilling, both for that and for the feeling of looking behind the shadowed curtain. Though it does also raise questions. Aya is supposed to do this job in order to earn the right to swap faces. That's what she was told at the beginning of the chapter. Yet now, she's being told she can swap faces in order to achieve the job. So there's logic in there, I suppose, if you care to find it, but it also doesn't make all that much sense. We question the teaching structure of this organisation again, and that sense of Aya weirdly being rushed through has to be addressed once more. Why are they doing it? What is their motivation? Or, if you want to take a lighter view, maybe the faceless men do have more of a conscience for collateral damage, and this is truly just a requirement to protect Brusco and his daughters. It'd be cool to think that, we'd like to think that. Whether that's true or not though, I'll leave you to decide. And what of Aya's reaction? Well, she smartly keeps her face placid because she's not supposed to want it. But inside, really, she's leaping. This is a victory. This is an aim achieved, even if it does mean the potential loss of the life that she likes in Cat of the Canals. But if that's what it takes, then that's what it takes. 
Aya is not thinking about what she can actually use such a skill for. It's still just a simple step up the ladder for her. It's a victory of achieving what she was told she couldn't. She does care for what this face is going to look like, but for now, we are only told that she'll be ugly, which hits on several key Aya themes of old. Still, that will have to wait because it is time to lift that curtain and enter the shadows. Now, you'll know we always like our Legend of Zelda comparisons here on the Isle of Faces, and this one definitely fits. You run around a temple for ages, thinking you've got the run of the place, and eventually you hit some switch and some hidden staircase appears, or a new passage, and it turns out there is a whole new secret level, completely hidden underground, where all the important stuff is kept. And yes, I am thinking of the uh, Deku tree from Ocarina of Time. I never knew that spiderweb broke it. It took me ages to figure that out when I was seven or eight or however old I was. Also, you know, throw Skyrim in there. That's pretty true as well. You mess around with the golden claw, a wall turns out to be a door, and then before you know it, you're in some Dwemer city or you're with the Drago or you're in Blackreach or something like that. There's always another level. There's always something to see. And George absolutely does not miss on the chance to create some atmospheric horror. We go past a still black pool. Silent gods. No one speaks. Only their footsteps can be heard as they descend, and those only barely. So we already have that creepy, solemn vibe going. And that's just at the beginning, as they head down to the vaults, where Aya has been before. So this isn't even behind the curtain yet. Then we have the physical change, as they go further down into smaller, windier tunnels. Black wormholes twisting through the heart of the rock, Aya calls them. Perhaps that's an ode to how the guild began in the mines of Valeria. Either way, it gives off that impression of something deep and hidden, and ground seldom trod. George continues building that atmosphere when we reach a heavy iron door that requires a special key. See, I told you, Zelda vibes. But that isn't the part that gets us going. Goose prickles rose along her arms. The sanctum. See, that's the sense of the moment that George is so brilliant at. We know that now. The door swings open without a sound, which seems creepy and unexpected. And then they are going down further into a world Iron knows nothing about. She's smart enough to count the steps as they descend into the cold earth, into what I think George is trying to get across here as a massive grave. That's what she's walking into. So yes, we very much feel the crypts and tombs <laughs> feeling from Skyrim now, don't we? Somehow they go further down until Aya believes they are actually under the canals themselves to really give us the sense of being somewhere special. And then we're walking through another door. We've reached our target. And even though we knew what we were coming for, George still manages to knock our socks off with this quote. Light washed over the walls around them. A thousand faces were gazing down on her. Holy hell. Yes, the phrase a moment is an understatement. This is it. A creepy vault of human faces used to go out on the world and do essentially whatever you like. This is a place of extreme hidden magic, the ultimate place of secrets and creepiness, and yeah, wow, George just really hits the nail here. Surely, all of our breath is caught in our collective chests right here. And it's also macabre, let's not forget. We've got some real chapter sequencing now when combined with Victorian in terms of making us feel weird and those shades of horror. And we'll get a hint of that in the next chapter at the end with Cersei's monster as well, but this is just something else entirely. Human faces, kept on the walls, used at will. This is a horror show. And though we're not at the end of the chapter here, and let's just pay attention to how brilliant this is to end this arc and what a payoff we're getting here for all of the Bravos run has built up in our minds. At times it's been slow, sometimes it's not even been my favourite, especially in Feast. But when we get to something like this, when we get this payoff, how can you not love it? Let me read a quote to you at length. They hung upon the walls, before her and behind her, high and low, everywhere she looked, everywhere she turned. She saw old faces and young faces, pale faces and dark faces, smooth faces and wrinkled faces. Freckled faces and scarred faces, handsome faces and homely faces, men and women, boys and girls, even babes, smiling faces, frowning faces, faces full of greed and rage and lust, bold faces and faces bristling with hair, masks, she told herself, it's only masks, but even as she fought the fort, she knew it wasn't so, they were skins, I don't know, take our hats off to the writing, what else can we do? Obviously, this is a type of ledge that we've never seen before, so the kindly man offers Aya one final chance to turn back to not jump into the complete unknown. And she actually considers it this time because this is just something different to all that's come before. He asks her if she's frightened and as per usual, she rallies in her internal monologue, telling herself of course she's not. She is well used to death, even more so after her work in the temple. She downplays the mystique of it all and tells herself that they are just tools and nothing else, nothing to be frightened of. That's what she says. But her body language gives herself away. Her blank face breaks. The biting of the lip returns. At first, she admits that she doesn't know what she wants. Internally somewhere, she is wondering if this is actually a step too far. But then she's convincing herself that she is the Night Wolf again, and there is no turning back. Still, she must say it quickly before she breaks. Do it, she blurted out. Okay, is your heart pounding at this point? Because it definitely should be. If it's not, 
You might want to ring the doctor. So we begin, and George teases yet more levels and gets in a chance for some more atmosphere, as I glimpse his tunnels made of human bones and columns made of skulls. What the hell is this place? She is literally in a place built by death. But then the operation, if we can call it that, is already beginning. The kindly man is already warning that pain is the price of power, and we're wondering what the hell we're actually going to see, and we're worrying about what will actually happen to Aya, until we're told, straight up, here's another quote, by rights the metal should have been cold against her flesh, but it felt warm instead. She could feel the blood washing down her face, a rippling red curtain falling across her brow and cheeks and chin, and she understood why the priest had made her close her eyes. When it reached her lips, the taste was salt and copper. She licked at it and shivered. Horror. It's, it's a horror book. What else can we say? We know that's George's background, and he's certainly proving that he still has those skills nice and sharp for us here. Aya is having her face sliced open. It's not so simple as just whacking on a face and having some magic dust sprinkled over you. No, there is a true cost, and it comes in a disgusting, painful way. So our level of Aya concern is sky high. Is this permanent? Is her original face now gone? Is the Aya we know now gone? And there is now clearly some level of magic involved. Blood magic, which we've talked about so many times in so many different areas, from blood sacrifice of the Weirwood, to King's Blood with Melisandre, to dragons, to everything else. And now it seems we've got another type entirely. But then there's this magic potion that Aya has to down. Some concoction that we're not really told the recipe of or the instructions behind or anything like that. And perhaps we'll never even find out. But it's all very deliberate and it's all very creepy. The kindly man confirms our suspicions that we've reached a whole new level when he basically calls out Melisandre and her glamours, as well as Artifice as well, by saying that they are something beneath what's happening here. They are fake and breakable. People can see through them, whereas this is something real to a degree it cannot be faked or matched it's just something else entirely so that very quickly makes us wonder if i will also learn about glamours that's what he's hinting out there if she stays in her education but to be honest that question falls out of our mind pretty quickly because aya is now given her new face and the physical description of it is what gets me this part is definitely no video game there's no flash of light and hey presto we're done we don't expect that in George's work anyway, but this is something else. The physical struggle to get the face to fit, like you're putting on an old welly on the wrong foot or something. At least that's how it begins anyway. But then the connection between her blood and the foreign flesh begins. Again, we have zero idea how this works and what the mechanics are, but it is working. This is magic as the two meld. But then something else comes right out of left field as Aya finds herself experiencing the memories of the face being laid upon her. At first, it's not even made clear that's what's happening. We could easily think that the kindly man or the wave are doing something to her until we hear the kindly man talk to Aya and we click just what is happening here. And it's something that sends us leaping right up the magical stratosphere now. As if the ability to take on another's face wasn't mind-blowing enough, we now have Aya experiencing the memory of a dead girl. And not just the events of it, like she's a fly on the wall, but the emotions, the terror. She is this other person in some way or another and our minds are blown even further apart. And maybe that's why this has to be shown via Aya or via Stark, I suppose, because it seems very, very similar to warging in its way. We were probably already convinced that this was way past anything we've seen from Melisandre and that kind of thing, but this puts it miles ahead. This is the biggest example of magic we've ever seen, depending on how you'd like to categorise the dragons. I know many have remarked that George includes more and more magic as the plot progresses, but I feel like when people ask what the top magical moments in the series are, it takes them way too long to arrive at this storyline. Because, I mean, what is happening here? She's being another person. How does flesh remember that? How does that transfer after this operation type thing? We don't know, but it is otherworldly. It's magical. It's, I don't know what to call it. It's a mystery, isn't it? And what are we even supposed to think right now? Aya has just undergone a treatment that defies explanation. She's had to actually feel the emotions of a truly traumatic event, one that is very, very dark, when we learn the details of it in a second, and it really makes you feel for this person who has now just wound up as a face. I think George is being very sneaky and crafty when he starts off the next paragraph with the words, the girl, instead of Aya, as if he's subtly already asking the questions of identity, because we still don't know the rules. Does this work like walking? If you keep the face on too long, do you forget who you are and just become them? Do you become trapped in these horrible memories? Anything could happen. And this feels like as good a time as any to address the morality of this thing, which is a weird path to take when talking about a bunch of assassins anyway, but we must think of it. Firstly, let's be clear. 
In keeping with the theme of today's episode, the servants of the House of Black and White are fanatics. Now, they're, they're different, that's true, because they seem a bit calmer and more put together than the Queen's Men of Ravasha, or Victorian and Makoro who are burning slave girls, or the High Sparrow and the Walk of Shame still to come. In fairness, I think it's more of an argument that there are more people in this religion aware that they are kind of using the Many-Faced God as a front and excuse for their activities. They're a bit more aware that they're running a business, as all organised religions are really, but they still have their true believers, I'm sure, lots of them. They still go around killing people based on what they think is due to their god, even if it is in a very different style. The Faceless Men are more of an organisation, like I say, a guild, than the others, but you get my point, don't you? And it's needless to say that this makes them very, very dangerous, and likely very, very cold, as we can see by the fact that they are putting a child through this type of procedure. And we could get into a long and messy talk about whether this face swapping thing has any morality in the first place. Did these dead people consent to this after they died? Is it a crime against nature anyway? Is this another abomination if we were to ask Bran and the old gods and all those type of people? And that's just considering if they do it to an adult. But Aya is not an adult. She is a child clearly not capable of making such a decision at her age clearly coerced and pointed toward this as the goal that she should want, and she's also not been clearly told about what will happen either. She didn't know she would experience those memories. She and we still don't know any of the small print, but they've let her sign the contract anyway. So we have to be very, very suspicious of their motives and scruples. And again, ask the question, why are they rushing Aya through this? Why are they so desperate? Anyway, that, that was a slightly larger tangent, so let's get back to the action. You might expect Aya to demand a mirror and then smash it while she laughs maniacally, if you're a fan of 1989's Batman. But instead, she just lifts her hand to her face, as you would, and feels... nothing. Or rather, she feels the face she has always known. Even Jack and Nagar's cool hand swipe trick doesn't work, and she feels no different. So what gives? It feels the same, she asks. To you, said the priest. It does not look the same. To other eyes, your nose and jaw are broken, said the waif. One side of your face is caved in where your cheekbone shattered, and half your teeth are missing. She probed around inside her mouth with her tongue, but found no holes or broken teeth. Sorcery, she thought. I have a new face. An ugly, broken face. Sorcery is right, that is the correct word. It's even more advanced than before. They haven't just put a face on Aya, they have a, a secret projection out to the rest of the world that actually isn't there. So yes, powerful, powerful stuff. But we probably like hearing it as a sign that real Aya still exists and is retrievable. She's just underneath. And here we learn that this is the face of a girl horrifically beaten and abused by her father, to the point her face was irrevocably damaged, or even more sadly, that she eventually sought escape via the gift of the faceless men. That hits us very deep, that's very painful. But it is also another great flash of Aya remaining Aya with this quote. Did you kill him? She asked the gift for herself, not for her father. You should have killed him, she thought. So it doesn't matter what packaging you put on her, even a new face, Aya remains Aya, and her themes of not just revenge but justice the justice that ties her to her father and the place of the Starks in the story in general are as strong as ever. I really like choosing this moment to double down on that. As if that's not all thrilling enough, when the kindly man announces that they are done, Aya thinks, for now, and she looks up to the rows upon rows of other faces. She doesn't say or think why, but to us it's clear that she's thinking what else she could do with all these other possibilities, and we're more excited than ever. What does that little tidbit mean for the future? Is she going to steal a whole bunch of them and take them back to Westeros if she learns the secret of how to actually put them on her face? Or can she just do it all the time now? We don't know. Or maybe she'll steal the bunch and pay for not knowing the secret and get stuck with her face or ruin it some other way. Who knows? The kindly man promised poor sleep and that turns out to be true, but for a different reason. Blessedly, she does not have to live through the beaten girl's horrors again, but she does dream of the faces in general. Yeah, okay, who wouldn't after you've just seen them for the first time? She did just live through a nightmare. But worse than that, her own personal trauma starts to seep in as she starts seeing the faces of her dead family in the faces upon the wall. Hey, that'd be a good marketing idea, HBO, if you haven't uh, used that yet for season five or six, whichever it was. And then that's added on to when her own kills come back to haunt her, right from the stable boy back in King's Landing to Darien in Bravos and all that came in between. She feels the killer again when she remembers the tickler, and if we want to be really morbid, we could view these dreams as a final goodbye to the life of the Starks and an embracing of the life of a killer, but we certainly hope not. Now, that all feels like a chapter's worth of content on its own, doesn't it? It certainly got our attention, and only now do we remember there's this whole other plot that we still have to deal with in terms of the job, the target, and there's still the mystery of this plan that came to Aya before she even knew about the new face. Yeah, we've still got that to cover yet. And she's acting all cool when she thinks it's a, a good day for a death, but she also thinks of her prayer. So Aya is still in there. 
she just knows enough of how to hide it. She heads out now with her new face, her new costume and the pocket knife just to remind us. Now it's not a Bravos chapter without more copious descriptions of the city, which we get now on the Isle of Gods and its many, many religions just to keep with today's theme. George also goes out of his way to paint the city as half empty, and Aya walking alone almost as if she were a ghost or perhaps an angel of death. The note of importance we do get is when Aya returns to the happy port and sees Tagano and Casso, king of seals. The man sees an ugly little girl that he does not recognise, but Casso barks and claps. Now Aya thinks that he either knows her or he just wants some fish. And we run with the first idea because it seems much more likely that animals can see through even magic such as this. And that could mean a lot for her in a relationship with cats, couldn't it? Or, more importantly, with direwolves. And therefore, wargs. Can they sense this magic? Are they, are they linked? Is this coming from the same branch or family of magical abilities? We don't know. I'd say not. I think warging's a little bit separate, but you never know. Now she comes to the purple harbour. She finds her target and then she waits. The city comes back to life around her as a cross-section of Bravos walks by from sailors to sex workers to bravos to red priests and Aya only waits. Then one man in particular, someone unknown to us, comes by and Aya begins her plan in earnest. She sneaks after the man and successfully cuts his purse and even if we don't know why, she seems triumphant until the man turns around and catches her. So we don't know what to think. We thought she was better than this. We thought it would have gone smoothly. Have we been through all of this chapter only to see her plan fail? Will she have a taste of the face only to have it taken away from her for failing the task? Instead, she gets away with her stolen coins littering the floor behind her. She uses her old knowledge to get away and then goes completely Batman by climbing to the rooftops. And then, all of a sudden, we're back at the temple with the kindly man and we're all confused again. Should I not be more upset or mounting another attempt? She failed, did she not? That's what it looked like. And the ever clearer answer is no, she did not. Aya killed the target, it turns out. As the kindly man recites for us, Aya was not trying to rob the man in the street, but plant something on him. She just made it look like a robbery to avoid suspicion. Aya, incredibly cleverly, knew that coin would make it to her target. Her target would bite it as he does every other coin. And we connect the dots that said coin was laced with poison thanks to the wave's help, and the man, the target, therefore died. It's absolutely untraceable. It's absolutely unremarkable. It's an act of genius. The whole thing is ridiculously clever and shows Aya's skills in terms of observation, intel, planning, timing, acting, and just out and out smarts. It's incredible, especially for a little hothead like her. I really can't commend her enough. We thought the face and the hearing and the fighting would be her biggest attribute, but it's not. It's her brain. It's Aya herself, and I love that George chooses to focus on that. So it's success then. We have acceptance as a proper acolyte, as an official member, that's what we're getting told here at the end. And I is going to be sent out to work immediately, which does in turn draw more questions about their need or what they're doing. She's off to join an apprenticeship, which again makes me think of the gentleman bastard stuff. She's going to have a new face, the face of mercy, we know thanks to the preview chapters. We get all that set up for us, we get all that tantalising us, it's just, it's superb. We finish with this quote. Who are you, child? No one, she replied. Gets you the chills, doesn't it? Because it means more than ever before. It's actually true to a degree this time, more true than it's been before. She just assassinated someone. Aya is one of them now. So there you go. What a chapter. Is it my favourite Aya Bravos chapter? I think it might just be. It's the most interesting, surely. It's amazing. It has a roller coaster of a ride. The horror, the intrigue, the secrets, the reveals, and the promise, and just the focus on Aya. It's Aya being amazing. Again, I. I love it. I'm still reeling from reading it. I'm still reeling from writing these notes about it. I think it's one of the best setups for wins as well, personally, out of these ones that we're getting today. I can't give it enough praise. And to be honest, I think it's the most complete of the goodbyes that we're having here on this episode. Despite the fact that she is the most removed from the rest of the book, or what the need for Aya chapters might be in dance, I still think that's true, that it's one of the best goodbyes. And that's a testament to George's love of writing this character, or our love for Aya as a POV. I mean, it is pretty hard to only appear in two chapters of this gigantic book, fairly separated chapters as well, with such a self-contained plot that doesn't touch the rest, and then you still come away with a feeling like this is one of the major moments of the end of the book, or at least that's how I feel anyway. This one really is a favourite. It does stand out, and it gets us very, very hungry for what comes later. So add that into the blind girl that we had roughly halfway through the book, which is another favourite, and I just think it's brilliant. George, you've done fantastically well with I here in this book. Now, as with the other chapters that we have in this episode, there are a thousand questions. And if we're honest, these ones specifically are probably more open than the rest of today's POVs because of that removed plot. 
If we didn't have the Wins Preview chapter to guide us in terms of Mercy, we'd have absolutely no idea what was coming her way. This mention of Isambaro would mean nothing to us, and we'd have a very hard time connecting how we could get from here, at the end of this chapter, to maybe a place where Aya does finish her training, or, or does want to come home, or, what, or whatever else it might be. And the Mercy chapter doesn't accomplish that entirely, but it does point us in the right direction. We can see the plot line start to form of how her themes will or could interact with her continuing to grow up with her memories of home taking a more direct route to her soul by appearing in front of her physically. And once again, there will be those reminders of how she is never, ever shedding that stark identity. So from there, we can begin launching other imagination ships of what particular vehicle might actually get Aya home. Whether she'll hear about John as well, or perhaps she'll have an amicable split with the Faceless Men, that's a good question. Whether they'll even reveal what their plans are for her, and that could include a return home as well. And then you can stretch it even further from there of what Aya does once she gets back to Westrosi Shores. Does she go for Cersei or the others on her list? I've spoken about it many times, and I still maintain... I see her going to the Riverlands, and that's my biggest hope anyway, because I just think she's so connected to that area, and she could go righting some wrongs that she witnessed there. She's our Riverlands POV overall. She can follow Catelyn's footsteps as Sansa has, just because I love that reflection that we spoke about a lot during Storm. And Feast as well, to be fair. And, you know, maybe I just wanted to meet Brienne. And with that would obviously come multiple Stoneheart theories that I've probably bombarded you with enough back at the time. And then, of course, I have no doubt she'll head back north for the ultimate ending. Now, as you can hear, I think, I'm much more engaged in the goodbye for this chapter than for most of our others today. And some of that is just because of the size of Aya's character in the story. She's as close to that Triforce mark as you can get without touching it, in my opinion. But then again, I consider the Stark children their kind of own Triforces, equal in some ways to, to John, Tyrion and Danny, but not in others if you get me, that's not the best way of explaining it, but I think you might understand. Either way, Aya is huge in the story, and we love her, so of course we care more, but also that interest is due in no small part to her dance arc, and this chapter specifically. It does an amazing job of getting us interested, getting us horrified, getting us brought in, and this is from someone you might remember if you've been listening long enough, who wasn't hugely fond of all the parts of Feast Eye just as a plot and the world building and that. Now, you've argued about that with me before, so I won't go into that, but I'm just saying they weren't my favourites. But these two, these two from Dance, have really got me back on side. And it also goes to show what a unique technique George is employing with Aya. No one else has had their POV number changed so drastically for two books in a row now. Sansa and Bran have had similar drops, although Bran was lower to begin with, but only for one book each yet, and you'd expect their number to rise again in wins. Aya, I'm going to guess, will experience a similar rise, but George has kept her going through both Feast and Dance. And if you do take a look at the Mercy chapter, then you can really see how George has expertly manoeuvred what should be a single book's arc over three separate volumes, which is it's mind-bending, to be honest, that he's managed to do that. What a skill, what a talent, what a chapter. I'm going to heap more praise upon it. And obviously that relates into the grand change that was the scrapping of the five-year gap and how George had to manoeuvre that. I personally think that Aya chapters are where we can see that change the most or where George has had to do the most work. I know maybe she wasn't the one who kicked off that decision for him specifically, but I think that's where we see the most trails of it, if you get me, the most footprints. Now, I doubt I'm alone in saying that Wind's Aya is one of the plot threads that I'm most interested in, however much more Bravos worldbuilding we might have to get to. I know I'm not alone in naming Aya one of my favourite characters overall, and this chapter perfectly encapsulates why. We have her proving that her smarts are her biggest value. We have this creepy new face thing and all its multiple possibilities. And we have her other multitude of learned skills as well, let's not forget them. The blind girl also gave us huge questions about her own warging ability and how it might surpass or at least be different to brands. That's incredibly interesting to me. And we have the promise of mercy and that whole new plot line. We have a thousand themes of revenge and justice and identity and she has just so much left to give us, I'm convinced, and I cannot wait to see it. I really can't. So I say without hesitation that for the, all the feast elements that have been moved over to dance, and for all those characters with two chapter arcs or less, Ayers is the standout of this book to me. To make such an impression in this crowded ending that we're seeing over three weeks of podcasts is amazing. And if it was up to me, I would go on and on and on about Aya and this chapter as well, because I think it's gold. I think she's gold. I love her. You do too. <sighs> We'll just have to leave it there, but wow. Yeah, I could talk about that one for ages. That is a great one. Thank you so much, George, for giving us that. But we still have one more to go. And, it, you know, she's kind of appeared actually once just in Aya's list. It is one of her former enemies, or future enemies possibly. We are heading back now for our last chapter to King's Landing as we go for Cersei 2. 
Now I'm going to assume that you can feel the weight from my voice of just saying that chapter title because you know what's coming. You know we've kind of lucked out with this being a last chapter of our episode because, well, George, he really isn't going to give us a rest here as we keep progressing towards the end of the book, which obviously makes sense. Lots might be different about this ending stage of A Dance with Dragons, but George hasn't lost his sense of drama. And besides, with so many of the more dance-focused storylines ending with their big things being delayed until wins, maybe he's going to make an effort to balance that out with bigger dramatic moments right here and that is certainly what we're getting in Cersei 2. I think you all know what happens in this chapter. I think very rarely you think of it as Cersei 2 and you more often think of it as the walk of shame. Yeah, it's going to be a tough one. We've just seen a huge progression for Aya as a character. She's reached a new stage of her life, but I think you can easily say that what happens to Cersei now is way, way bigger. And perhaps that's because Aya changes all the time, that's part of her youth. And she's trending upward, kind of, at least, theoretically, in her chapter. Cersei is going to go in the complete opposite direction today. Still, it is quite a pairing to end with, isn't it? These two really important, really amazingly written chapters going back to back, we are pretty lucky. Now we've already seen possibly the biggest ever change in Cersei's life in her fall and her imprisonment back in Feast and in Cersei 1 as well but that seems almost minuscule today as we witness one of the truly cruelest most difficult reads in the series. I know I seem to be saying that a lot but it's just as true now as it ever was and that plays brilliantly over the fact that this is happening to Cersei Lannister who is essentially our original villain. She was the one that Ned was worried about back in his, essentially, flagship arc. She's the one that Sansa and I hated, and that involved a Tyrion, and etc, etc. You know how it went, but she is the big deal. We're talking series-wide, really. Just cast your minds back to A Game of Thrones for a second. She was presented to us as the original Sin, right from the icy comments everyone was making before she even stepped out of her gigantic wheelhouse. That suddenly got bumped up massively to her being the incest that started the whole war, that kicked off the series. She was the one that did bring Ned down, and that got worse over the next two books as she became the antagonist to both Sansa and Tyrion. And even though we were given a window that at least semi-explained why she was this way, she just became another type of villain once she actually did gain control. She wasn't a POV until Feast for Crows, that's true, but that was only another aspect of her. She was already a central building block of the series, as we've outlined, and an awful, awful person. She's evil. There's no way to soothe it. I understand there can be sympathetic elements for some of you, or at least reasons why this has come about, but the bottom line is Cersei is awful. Just because we've not had to deal with her much in dance, let us not forget everything that's come before in the first four books. I really, really can't put up with any arguments to the contrary that she's just she's terrible, bad, really bad. And yet, somehow, for all that, George gives us a punishment that does not fit the crime. For all the many, many reasons we might want Cersei to suffer or pay for her crimes, it is resolutely not what we have today. So this is obviously a superb combination for what George has done with Theon. They have their differences, such as Theon actually discovering the error of his ways and risking his life to help someone else, whereas Cersei doesn't do anything of the sort, but the sheer amazingness of George pulling that kind of thing off twice in one book, one section of the book as well, must be highlighted. And that'll be interesting come wins, where we assume we are going to find a Cersei who, somehow, will be an even worse version of herself. And when that comes, we're going to have to ask ourselves very difficult questions if those still coming and very likely violent acts are valid given what we have seen happen to her today. That's going to be a very complex discussion, trust me. Thematically, you're obviously not going to find much better. There's a reason that there has been heaps and heaps written on this chapter by many of your favourite content creators. I encourage you to go and read and listen to all of those because it hits on so much of what we've been talking about, again, through much of the series. Whether that be focusing on Cersei and the many deep conversations we could have on womanhood and sexuality, or to be more specific, the kind of sexual violence we get here. I'm not sure if the term is correct, but is that passive-aggressive sexual violence? Is that what we have? Could be, I'm not sure of the term. But there's also the aura of power that we've talked about before, and how that is again very, very different for a woman, as well as their perceived value in the society. On top of that, there can be talk about self-fulfilling prophecy, the high amount of politics involved, and so, so much more. We have bunches to get through. Let me give you just one example. We're going to get to this as we go, but Cersei's ageing and the changes in her body have been a discussion since A Game of Thrones. George has put the little hints and clues in there. She's always had a layer of denial about the whole thing, partly because of arrogance and ego and self-worth, and partly because she couldn't bear for that to actually be true, because that's all anyone has ever seen as worthy in her. And that is this society's mark. That's definitely what she was told by Tywin and by Robert and everyone else, really. And now that change is unhidden. It's out there for everyone to see. 
and both power dynamics, incredibly unfair ones, and self-worth are going to be majorly adjusted. Now that's an aspect of this that might commonly be brought up first because it's one of the more obvious. So let me counteract that with one of the more subtle, again, just as a way of example. One of the harder parts of this to remember is that this is a culmination of the very, very long rivalry between Cersei and the small folk. This whole series in many ways is about the clash between the up aboves, the nobles, and the lowers, the small folk. And Cersei is really a great encapsulation of that. It's another aspect that's been around since the very beginning of her story. It's another of those big building blocks. She's forever hated them, through her childhood, up to when Joffrey was king, when Marjorie came in loving them, during the Blackwater, for example. The references are numerous. Don't forget the Bread Riots, for example. And absolutely, of course, when she was queen, or when she was regent, rather. She has always seen them as things, little annoyances that she's burdened with, and who should automatically love her for who she is. She thinks she's better than them. There's no arguing that. And now we're going to see that relationship between the two at its most raw. Which probably points me to giving you a fair warning, because this is a nasty old chapter with some very, very difficult parts. Parts that I am far below qualified to talk about. So I again encourage you to look at all the great coverage already given over to this chapter and to Cersei in general. I'll try and get some links in the description or at least tweet them out for you. I'm sure you know where to go already. And there are parts that will be uncomfortable for many of us to read through or think about. So just come into this one with your shields up would be my recommendation. Now we have one more thing before we actually dive into the text. This is a chapter about Cersei, of course. It's almost like a little one-woman play, actually, this chapter. And the majority of our focus will remain on her, as is right and proper. But this is also a chapter massively about Kevin Lannister, which is fitting, considering his epilogue is not so very far away now. His own evil, his own misogyny, and his ambition and ruthlessness are no better displayed than right here despite the fact he only actually appears for the briefest second at the very end. His tainted hand is all over the crime that we're about to witness, and I'll save really digging into that for where it will naturally come up in the chapter, but be warned yet again, because this guy is awful, 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 as George is about to prove. I think we'd best get into it. We begin not really having any idea of what's coming our way. It was mentioned last time out, that's true, but only very quickly, and in the middle of a slew of other information about King's Landing and Dawn, so it easily could have slid by our attention. And even if we did note it, it wasn't explicitly told what would actually happen. But these opening paragraphs give us a pretty clear idea of what's going to go down, especially as Cersei thinks on the High Sparrow's promise that the crowds will be kept away, that no one will touch her. So I guess as debilitating, awful, breaking punishments wrapped up as religious ceremonies go, it's all going to be above board, that's the official line. Funnily enough though, that hasn't quite worked in terms of reassuring Cersei, and it doesn't work with us either. Just the mention that it's a promise from the High Sparrow is enough to make us think that something could go very, very wrong. As wrong as could be. Especially when Cersei brings up the bread riots. So right from the off here, in the first paragraph basically, we have our emotional conflict, it's going to be thrown straight at us. Let's talk about this again. We've hated Cersei. We've done that lots. We've laughed at Cersei. We've done that lots, especially in Feast. We've been disgusted by what she's done, and we've cried for comeuppance and justice. Yet even here, at the beginning, before anything actually happens, I think we all have the collective sense of, oh no, I didn't mean this, George. We might want a great many things for Cersei, but not this. Because we remember the terrible crimes of the bread riots. We do know how much these small folk hate her and how much they'd like to settle the score. We remember what more mentality can look like and it's absolutely not something we want to see. And let's be clear, that's me talking about worst case scenarios, but even the best case scenario for this walk is still barbaric and awful and way, way too much. Does not fit the crime. Now, those bread rights while we're talking about them, that especially works if you think about thematic links. Sansa was very nearly assaulted and killed during those riots, and she was in that position mainly due to Cersei's machinations, who also abused her through that entire arc, Sansa's prisoner arc. So is George just going to give some poetic justice by making Cersei suffer the same fate that Sansa nearly had to? Well, we really hope not. And yet, somehow, here's the brilliance of George, really. Somehow, Cersei manages to not change our mind about that, but just throw it back in our face a bit, because here she gives comments about Lollis Stokeworth, who obviously suffered unimaginably during those bread riots, and how worthless the woman is. And then she's comparing Lollis to herself, who she still considers to be the peak of human attractiveness, and therefore worth much more than Lollis, just to remind you of how truly awful and soulless Cersei actually is. So we have that real conflict from the beginning. Our hatred of Cersei still burns bright, she's still rubbish in all facets, and yet we still think, no, George, not this. 
We might even be tempted to feel a bit smug right here at the beginning and how undone she's becoming because, hey, we do like comeuppance and we know that she does deserve something. And maybe we think uh, maybe there won't be violence and we don't even have the unclothing part of it quite confirmed just yet. So maybe it'll just be a good chapter of Cersei having to feel bad about herself. That's what we're hoping, for first time readers at least. For now, she's trying to convince herself that she is brave enough to face what comes and as usual, she refers to the idea of a lion. Although this time she's actually being literal as she recalls how back at Cassidy Rock in their youth, she was braver than Jamie, the golden boy warrior, at daring to touch the lions caged within the rock. Jamie never tried half as much as she did. I should have had the sword, not him. Now I'll let you decide what kind of sword Cersei actually means here, but it's another discussion that we've had before multiple times about Cersei's relationship with the male sex, her semi-jealousy of such if you want to call it that, and her hopes of what she could have done had she been born a man. We've built on that plenty of times before as well, but we also have this idea, this imagery, of pulling the lion's mane, that's what she's talking about here. Now back then, the lion was the enemy of the game, and Cersei might not realise how much that might be still true today. The memory is not having its desired effect. She is still worried and is still trying to convince herself that it'll all be okay. By evening, it'll be done. It's just a walk and then she'll be back to Tommen, back to Mega's Holdfast and back to safety. It's just a walk, like she's done hundreds of times before, she says. Although, I point out, has she? How many times has she actually walked through this city? I'm going to bet it's not a lot. I think that was actually a point of George's earlier in the series, how normally she's going about the city in a litter or something similar, or she had that gigantic wheelhouse at the beginning. Normally she's protected by her prestige and her wealth and position. Now obviously we're going to get as far opposite as you can go. Now obviously she's not going to bring herself to dwell in the inaccuracies of that statement, or she's just going to lose all composure here at the beginning. Importantly, we're told that Kevin has told her it's the only way to save herself. Now, I already mentioned this a lot last time, and we have been discussing it over on Patreon at length at times, but if you happen to glance at the Brandon B. Fish essay that I referenced, The Quiet Lion, well, part of the arguments that Brandon B. Fish makes in that is that it's super likely Kevin was a driving force in making this happen. And I should point out, I haven't reread that essay lately because I didn't want to be influenced for my notes, but I remember off the top of my head the key parts, and I remember it's a great crack and read, so you should definitely check that if you haven't. Some well-made points in there are going to come up through this chapter i'm sure so anyway super likely that kevin was a really big part in making this happen it may well have even been his idea so like i said earlier we'll look for evidence of this as we go and well here's our first case kevin really wants this to happen to cersei and he's trying to box her into thinking that she has no other options to make sure it all goes as planned in a moment cersei will actually mention that kevin refused to challenge the high sparrow now we can ask is it refused to challenge or is it actively encouraged the high sparrow we don't know at the very least, she has already realised that she cannot trust Kevin. Now, a lot of the reasons that she can't trust him are of her own making, that's very true. But that doesn't change the fact. So just latch on to that idea, Cersei, it will serve you well. But the idea of options is still in her mind, and she considers if there are any others. But really, there's only choosing the trial straight up instead. And that seems even riskier, even if it is perhaps more dignified. If she chooses that choice, then there's no chance for her grand Kingsguard plan, the one we still don't really know about, just for some extra motivation to read on. And she really thinks that that is going to work, that's the one to go for, so she is going to stick with this for now. And even that Kingsguard plan is still her second choice, remember. If it was up to her, she'd have Jaime defending her, his sword hand restored, and everything would be rosy, according to what she says here. So if we move past the fact that Cersei is desiring Jaime purely for what he can bring to her, again, we refer to the Cersei only seeing people as things that are or aren't of use to her thing, then we do at least get to relish her having to think about Jaime choosing Brienne over her again. She doesn't see it in that way, of course, but we know it to be true. But anyway, that's all, that's all by the by, because Jaime is not an option. A trial is not an option. So this walk is what's left. And she reasons if she can get out of this and sort the Kingsguard so that a trial by battle would now work to her advantage, because it definitely doesn't in her current state, then she believes ultimately she will be saved. If she gets to Tommen, she will be saved. That's what she tells herself over and over. And we can sense the desperation, the clinging to her last strand of hope, because she knows that this walk is about to come, and deep down she knows it will be awful. Tommen is a good little boy, a good little king. He will do as he's told. And again, I mention that quote because it's what return she can get from her loved ones that matters to her. She loves Tommen, sure, I'm not arguing that, but she also wants some use out of him. You can't argue that either. She takes one last stab at self-reassurance, this time even saying it aloud as the dawn comes. Only my pride will suffer. The words rang hollow in her ears. And we are likely unconvinced as well. In her desperation, she dreams of Jamie yet again. 
that golden warrior in the sun that Tyrion often thinks of as well. She tells herself if Jaime ever loved her, now would be the time to show it. And we know that's not going to happen. And we also know that's one of the very few good things about this chapter. And then, from there, we begin. The scepters return, but before they go, Cersei is surprised to learn that they intend to shave her first as a, another stab, another peg to take her down with. And that, of course, links into the value placed on looks as using that as a weapon against her, as removing all kinds of armour and making her more vulnerable than ever. As we saw many times back in Feast, Cersei now refers to her own long list of titles in her own head. She reminds herself that she is the daughter of Tywin as a way to draw strength, as that's what she unfortunately believes he represented, and she, admirably, to be fair, faces down the scissors because of it. We know this is a major thing for Cersei because her hair is massively important to her. You could easily say it's her most important feature. So we have all the self-worth tied up in looks and physical value again. And I don't think I really need to tell you about how unfair and stupid that is and how it's really rotted Cersei's take on the world around her as she's grown up. But we also have this specifically being the Lannister symbol she's losing here, the golden curls, the thing that ties her to Jaime the most, to her whole family. Again, go back to Game of Thrones and see how often that particular feature of hers is described. It relates to her power and her worth deriving from that family name, as we've explored in the past both with her and Tyrion. Jaime, he benefits from it as well, but of the three, he would still have the easiest path had he not been born a Lannister. The other two would suffer much, much more. And while we're talking of that Lannister trio, the loss of Cersei's hair fits into this massive idea I'm sure you've heard of before about this generation, the children of Tywin, all losing their one big thing, their one big ability at some point in the story. Whether this is supposed to be as a payback or a curse for Tywin and what he gave the world, or comeuppance from their own evils and their original place as being the series antagonist, or whatever it might be, it is a pretty intriguing idea. For the unaware among you, we're talking about Jaime having lost his hand, and therefore his sword fighting ability slash his status as the warrior. That's the most obvious one, it's the most definite one, it's the one with the quickest and most obvious effect, and it's the one that we've covered so far. It's actually happened. Now we have Cersei losing her hair, and therefore at least a part of her beauty, though that one isn't as clear cut as Jaime's, if you forgive the pun. It's not just the loss of hair, or the fact that she's gained weight or anything like that, some of it is natural ageing, some of it will probably be reversible. Cersei can't be brought down simply by having a haircut, but it's the context in which she has it combined with this showing off, this bringing down she's about to have from the public. It's the removal of status and the perception of beauty slash untouchableness that Cersei now loses, or is about to lose. And the third, which obviously hasn't happened yet, is the idea of Tyrion losing his tongue, and therefore a major part of how he conveys his intelligence and cunning to the world, his communication. I can't remember where that idea actually comes from, please forgive me if it is someone specific, but it's been discussed at length many many times, and there's plenty of foreshadowing to be found throughout the series that could point us to actually seeing this tragedy at some point. Or, you could argue that Tyrion has already suffered the loss of freedom, or the loss of his name, and that's his big curse, but that doesn't fit quite so well, and it's not a physical thing like it is with the other two. Or, you know, maybe this is just an idea, and it'll never happen anyway, we don't really know for Tyrion. But the general thing is, each Lannister loses their top ability and how they made their bread, whether it be brawn, beauty, or brains. And then they will have to adjust, as we've seen Jaime do already. Will Cersei and Tyrion be able to do that in the same manner as their brother? Hmm, doubtful in my opinion. Either way, I think we all agree, let's get back on track here, that Cersei losing her hair is not the same as someone losing their hand or tongue. Not at all. And out of the three, she'd have the best shot at regaining that aura of beauty at some point, even though she probably won't. She also has the best chance of solving the problem simply by changing her perception of power and how she views worth in other women, but again, likely not. It's much more likely she'll become more toxic, more obsessed with the idea of the younger and more beautiful, as Marjorie, Ariane, Daenerys, and maybe Sansa all enter or re-enter the scene. And I can guess she's probably going to act out even more violently than before. What will be interesting is how she confronts that evaluation of other women now she has lost one of her main beautiful features. Now she's been forced to confront the changes in her body, as well as that perception and supposed loss of value from everyone else. Will she see the reality or will she go back further into her delirium? Will she seek to make her worth in other ways as she's often dreamt of? And obviously within there are so many conversations that we can have about how moronically stupid and unfair it is that she's only been valued in that way as well. I think I'm pointing out the obvious there, aren't I? Now that is quite a lot of tangent talk there because we've only got to the first half of this discussion on beauty. The outer input will come later from the crowd. Right now it's the removal of hair and Cersei tells us straight up how emotional this is for her. 
this is supposed to be hers. When so much of what she's had has traditionally been derived from the men in her life, this was the one thing of her own, that and her children. This is a part of her identity and something that shouldn't have anything to do with anyone else, and yet they're taking it from her. Plus, she outlines exactly what it's worth and doubles down on what we've said in terms of symbols. Here's the quote. My crown, the queen thought. They took the other crown from me, and now they are stealing this one as well. So there you go. That's exactly what we've said. That feels good. She knows this is a reduction of power going on here. The upper buffs trying to take her down a level. This is the true end of that feast arc with her as ruler. And you know what? Screw it. Let's go on another tangent talk here about why publicly this is being done. We'll start with the hair and we'll work our way out. What is the official reason for the shaving of her head and how does it relate to the official reason of this being a walk of atonement? quote unquote giant very big quote unquote marks there well the idea is that this is supposed to be a message from the faith from society that you Cersei or you women in general should not get ideas above your station you should be meek and cowering and apologetic for being the thing that we say you are a walking baby machine only worth something related to sex and nothing more. The crimes laid against Cersei are sexual in nature, mostly. And okay, some of them, or some aspects of them, are fair and true. But why should this specifically be the punishment for them? What does walking nude through a crowded street do to atone someone? To which I again say, it's supposed to meeken them. Is, is that a word? I'm not sure. It's supposed to say, how dare you allegedly use your gender or sex or beauty to further your station or do something outside the rules or do something we don't like. That is not allowed. So we will now basically embarrass you as much as possible so that you feel too ashamed to ever think of doing the same again. There's a super weird sexualization of Cersei from her uncle, the High Sparrow, and society in general, where all at once they seem to say, this is all you're worth, and also, how dare you only be worth such a thing? So the partnership with religious fanatics is pretty convenient for Kevin. And I mention Kevin here because that's the official line, that this is atonement, that she's being shaved to rid her of some of the sexual power she has, to reduce the attractiveness that she's apparently misused, and to again embarrass her and to bear all. And Cersei will say in a moment that she has no hair to hide behind. So the idea is that everyone is going to see as much as they possibly can. Now where I pick at it is that the official line has nothing to do with what's going on here. Not at all. This is not a required punishment. This wasn't the only possible avenue to go down. It was chosen as an extra, an unneeded cruelty with an official line to hide behind, but with a much more sinister and beneficial purpose. Like I mentioned earlier, the two schools of thought are that either the High Sparrow suggested this or Kevin suggested it. Now I recall from that Brendan Beefish essay that he says it was the latter, it was Kevin, and I, again, agree. But either way, they both get the advantages, whoever suggested it. If this is allowed to happen to the King's Mother and the former Regent, it super legitimises the power of the faith in the city at this time. They look really official, they look in control, and they look like the crown runs through them. It gets them to the table, basically. Anyone can guess what the High Sparrow's actual motives might be, but this seems pretty likely to be something that he would want, to increase the prestige and the power of the faith, which adds on to the fact that both Cersei and Marjorie can be tried. That, again, just makes them seem super legitimate. And he then shares a benefit with Kevin, in that this is also designed to just get Cersei out of the way, effectively. The idea is that she'll be so ridiculed and thought of as spoiled and undervalued now, which, which sounds just horrible to say, combined with the hope that she'll be meek and ashamed and want to hide away, or maybe even go back to the rock, or whatever it might be, and Kevin will therefore be left to rule properly and rebuild House Lannister as best he can. And okay, some of this is probably best kept for the epilogue, and we might have to do some repeating there, but let's go into it here, because the fact of the matter is that those inclinations from Kevin aren't wrong in the political sense. Cersei was absolutely horrific as a regent, we know that. She was plunging the realm, the city, the crown and House Lannister into chaos. She absolutely did need to be removed and Kevin needed to clear the palette, build accounts of the Tyrells and get on with some better ruling, which we know the truth of thanks to his ending with Varys in the epilogue. So that's all fine, get her out of the way, okay understandable, but not like this, not in this cruel super creepy, super sexualized way, I'll say it again. This is way beyond an overreaction. It's downright evil. So what is clear is this was not 100% a political move from Kevin. It was not a, well, I love my niece, but for the good of the realm, I must. It wasn't even a, I'm indifferent to my niece, but for the good of the realm, I must. It was a, I hate my niece and I want to teach her a lesson. Hence why this avenue was chosen. Because Kevin is a piece of shit. He's a misogynist. He wants to hurt Cersei because she's a woman. And let's not forget that his own past has a real connection to this. What happened to his father, Titus, and his mistress. What Tywin did to her. We've had some great discussions of that with patrons recently. 
If I had more time, I'd get further into that, but unfortunately we're up against it. And again, that's going to be much better covered in the epilogue, but we've already touched on some of his motivation in Cersei 1. He believes that Cersei corrupted Lancel. He believes she's acting above her station. He believes that women shouldn't be making such a fuss. So again, I ask you, what is Cersei being punished for? Yes, it's presented as atonement for infidelity, but we all know it's nothing to do with that. She's being punished, at least on some level, for what she did to Lancel and that mockery that she made of House Lannister in Kevin's eyes. Even in the High Sparrow's eyes, I really don't buy into him actually thinking she's atoning. He and Kevin have continued to do it as this measure of reducing her power and effectiveness, and therefore, again, securing their own. Now, Kevin can't be threatened as regent. The fate looks super important. We've said it all before. Now, the larger point is obviously that we figure it's not going to work. Kevin especially believes that this is all in aid of teaching her a lesson and basically subduing her back to a more respectable level expected of a woman. Yeah, God, this makes me angry saying stuff like that. The High Sparrow isn't too far off the same. And maybe it will come very close to working. But now, at the end of the chapter, and I'm skipping ahead quite a bit here, we're going to have a Cersei with a bigger chip on her shoulder than ever, with the means to distribute some real revenge via her mysterious Kingsguard edition. We'll get to that later. But I definitely think that's what we are expecting to happen come wins. Now again, that was that was massive tangent talk, but we needed to get it off our chest because, uh, Kevin, just what a dick. Let me get back to the actual text now. We'll get back on track again. Cersei now has to face the extra levels of shaving. It's not just her head that's in question here. And she braves that challenge straight up. As she did in the previous chapter, she revels in the sexual memories of her and Jamie because that's essentially her happy place. That's her secret armour and the thing that no one can touch. Well, Brienne might have something to say about that, but still. Anyway, Jamie is warmth and the reality of the day is cold. And so Cersei must go on. When she laughs a bitter laugh and is scolded for such, Cersei shows that she is still facing this as a lioness. She's staying strong, using her hate and desire for revenge as fuel. We have this quote. But one day, I will have your tongue ripped out with hot pincers, and that will be hilarious. Yeah, that's the Cersei we know and expect. She still fully believes that she will come out of this and be able to visit revenge upon all of those here. And we'll have to wait to see if that confidence wavers at all. And on her way out, she also makes a superb point about the hypocrisy of the faith as they all turn away from her, which we could go on about for hours, to be honest. Finally now, it is time to leave. And note that it is Cersei who says, let us go. She is still bearing herself proudly, still giving out orders. Plus, she is still able to just focus on the end goal. Forget the means, I will end up with Tommen. And that's all that matters. And for all that we talk about Cersei abusing Tommen and using him as a route to power, which is all absolutely true, she does still love him. She's still a mother who's been ripped away from her one remaining child, whose safety is always in question. So Tommen as motivation and love is 100% true, even when it comes to comparing how she arrived here and how she's going to leave. Remember, we made very similar comparisons to how Tywin arrived and left King's Landing. She still focuses on the end goal. Doesn't matter, couldn't care less, I'm leaving. Keep the focus on the horizon. And we'll see that same strategy employed in a moment when she can physically see the Red Keep. Now, even at the beginning of the journey, still within the Sept, mind you, Cersei can feel the eyes of the Watchers. She even thinks that the Seven themselves are looking. Unfortunately, it's about to become much, much worse. Now we meet her escort of the Warrior's Sons, who are as polished and shiny as possible, perhaps as a device to show the Faith's dominance over her. Here are our loyal knights looking their very best. Look at this woman walking barefoot through filth in comparison, as we're going to see in a second. We also re-meet the fantastically named Sir Fearden Wells, who did pop up in Feast, actually. He is the commander of the Warrior Sons, so all the prestige of the Sept is being given to Cersei here, although I doubt that makes her feel much better. We've got to wonder if Sir Fearden will turn up again and wins in some major role. You'd think he'd definitely appear due to the trials, but will he be of importance? Perhaps he will even be the first to fall to Gregor or something. Maybe. Uh, could be, but that's probably by the by again. For Cersei barely acknowledges the man at the moment, or his promise that she'll be safely guarded across the city. And for what it's worth, I think Sir Fearden is genuine in his commitment to that promise. Instead, she focuses in on someone who has been so critical in her life and her fall, even though she never gave him a second sport back in the day. He was background and nothing more, like so many others to Cersei. I'm talking about Lancel. As you expect, the reaction is pretty large actually, seeing this person that you blame for putting you in this position, even though she was the one to completely abuse and nearly kill him, and it's his father that she really needs to be looking at. But we get a repeat of that evidence of strength from the previous page. First, there's a desire for vengeance. My blood and my betrayer. She would not forget him. So in classic Cersei mode, she believes that Lancel has stepped over the mark by betraying her because they are family and they should be loyal. Again, completely bypassing all that she's done to him. 
but there's also this promise of not forgetting him. Now, I don't know about you and your thoughts on Cersei's strength or ability come wins, but I'd be pretty worried about Lancel's future, to be honest, especially if Cersei also finds out Kevin's level of involvement in this whole thing. He is another Gregor candidate in my mind. And we have the repeat of still giving orders as she tells Sir Vierden to rise and that she is ready. Almost as if this is all the most natural thing in the world and it doesn't bother her at all. She's still retaining that queenly image for now. So the doors open and Cersei is reintroduced to the people of King's Landing. She breathed in the scents of sour wine, bread baking, rotting fish and night soil, smoke and sweat and horse piss. No flower had ever smelled so sweet. So her hatred of the city has gone nowhere. She still considers it an awful place far beneath her. It's full of scum and it's horribly dirty. And she's actually right about quite a lot of that. But even so, she hated imprisonment that much more. And then we get a far more interesting paragraph as Cersei reflects on the irony that once, in this very spot, Eddard Stark died because of her. Now she doesn't see it that way, of course, as she reflects on how Joffrey went off script and ruined all their well-laid plans. But we know that she put Ned in that position in the first place and that she was the ultimate Joffrey enabler. So she as much as killed him as anyone else did. Still, it's incredibly interesting to see what the actual plan was supposed to be. We've established long ago that Ned wasn't supposed to die, but we've never been able to see it from her point of view and with so much detail, at least not to my memory. Ned was supposed to go to the wall. Rob would have been left as Lord of Winterfell, bound by the deal that his father made to not go to war. Unfortunately, it would change little for Sansa, as she still would have been kept a hostage, and probably I too if they ever found her. And oh yes, don't think we miss the fact that Peter Baelish tried to skip a few steps and marry Sansa right there and then. Fucking creep, fucking Peter Baelish. I'm very really tempted to go on another huge tangent about how early on he had his plans, but I'll keep it Cersei-centred for now. In the past, we've thought and discussed what this eventuality might have been like, especially for Ned being up at the war with Jon, because a bigger disruptor to a POV's arc, I really struggled to think of. And personally, I say woe betide the others if Ned does get up there, but we unfortunately do not have the time to consider such possibilities again, given our focus needs to be on Cersei in all fairness. And that's without her other beliefs about Tywin being frayed up to face Stannis and Renly and all the other unknowable changes to the storyline that Ned's living would have given us. I feel like I haven't said Alas Alarms nearly as much in this book, likely because we're so tied to things that can still happen now, but really the potential of Ned not dying is the biggest Alas Alarm of the whole series, both on a national level and then right down to the lives of his children. It changed and dictated everything. It's still one of the biggest plot points of the story. It's really George's calling card still. And it's poignant for Cersei to look back now on that huge mistake that she made and think of how it all led to her being in the position that she put Ned in, even if it does seem so long ago to both her and us. That's the kind of comeuppance we really want to see, not what we actually get though. This is something closer to Theon facing his old crimes, even if it's nowhere near that level of intensity. And Cersei isn't actually even thinking about how it's her fault. But we definitely like how it all ties together and how Cersei has ended up the villain to the people as she made Ned out to be. Plus it's always a good reminder of what a total moron Joffrey was. Now come the real eyes as Cersei looks out on a plaza just as crowded as Ned's final day. And we remember that was way past standing room only thanks to Arya and later Barristan being in those crowds. That makes you wonder if there is anyone stood in this crowd that Cersei doesn't see. Maybe we'll find out at some point. She also realises that she's been made out as a type of entertainment. Everyone has come out to see her. They've even brought their kids along because all they want is to gloat, to get their vengeance, to feel good about themselves for once. And because, let's face it, King's Landing doesn't have a thriving entertainment industry anyway. She recognises that they want to see her brought low, as she looks through and thinks of them as scum and filth and all these other things beneath her. Though she also sees the poor fellows scattered throughout. They're just a constant part of the society now, thanks to her. There's time for one last hope that Jamie will appear and save her, but that proves fruitless as well. Then we learn the extra detail that Kevin is not even present, that Cersei must do this alone and entirely separate from House Lannister so as not to shame them, which makes us way, way angrier at Kevin's own hypocrisy of not letting her shame them with something that he has likely organised. And it also fits with what we said earlier about Ames. Isolate Cersei further, give her less allies to make trouble with, make her worthless on the political stage if even her family aren't beside her, and then at the same time he is not dragged down by association and neither is the family that he intends to drag back up. Again, it's just disgusting of how he's basically going to leave her to it and he gets to save himself from his own consequences or any guilt or ugliness if this all goes wrong and again this could go very wrong we don't know as first time readers if Cersei's going to make it through this she could be assaulted or raped or killed or anything this could be the real big ending of the book now we all assume that's not going to happen because it seems like she's just got way too much left to do in terms of relating to other characters but you don't know do you this it could all be awful so again kevin pure evil Let's get another quote from her. She would have her son again. She would have her champion. 
Her uncle had promised her. Tommen is waiting for me. My little king. I can do this. I must. If she has no allies to support her, then she must rely on the goal, which she does now as she focuses on the Red Keep, it looking so beautiful now in comparison to what lays before her. Again, she rationalises and reassures. It's not too far, it's just a walk and then I'm done. And then, as the quote tells us, she'll have what she wants in Tommen and this mysterious champion, although the part about Kevin's promises definitely worries us. Or she does all this and then finds the gates barred or something terrible like that. No, thank you. The three scepters now make their announcements about who this is and why she's about to do this walk. So it really touches on what we said earlier about the official line and why in the world this specific punishment should prove anything about atonement or her previous crimes. As you'd expect, it's typical churchy bullshit. Putting aside pride, being humble, having nowhere to hide her secrets... It's very similar to what we mentioned earlier. And this is when Cersei now remembers Titus's mistress and her walk of shame and the fact that the whole thing was Tywin's idea, or his command at least. Probably idea as well. I doubt Kevin was involved in that one. So perhaps we do even see an irony and a comeuppance of sorts that Tywin's own daughter is now suffering the fate that he once bestowed on another woman. Yes, it's his rotten legacy back again, as always. It also makes you think about how opportunistic Kevin is being. Obviously, I don't think I need to say it, Tywin would have never ever allowed this to happen to Cersei under any circumstance while he was alive and Kevin obviously never would have dared to suggest such but now that Big Bro's gone then you can do what you want you get to be in charge for once don't you get to step out of the shadow finally just like the insect that he is but Cersei is not thinking of that memory for the relationship between brothers and what their father got up to she's thinking of what the reaction was from the populace of Lannisport she's thinking of what the reaction was from the populace that that woman was forced to walk among how they reveled in her shame and embarrassment and how she tried to hide herself vain and proud she was before she remembered one guard saying so haughty you'd think she'd forgot she came from dirt once we got our clothes off her though she was just another whore Cersei's worst nightmare that is we know that she wants to avoid it at all costs, especially being thought of as weak or beneath the others. She's not going to give them that pleasure. If Sir Kevin and the High Sparrow thought they would be the same with her, they were very much mistaken. Lord Tywin's blood was in her. I am a lioness. I will not cringe for them. La Queen shrugged off her robe. So it's good that she recognises that this is what Kevin wants, again, as we've discussed at length, and she seeks Tywin once more, the lioness identity, to form her strength around as she did all the way through Feast and probably in the years before then. And note that George uses the term the Queen, not Cersei, when she shrugs off her robe. And really, this is a moment we can't undersell. Both narratively, in Cersei having to bear rule and surrendering herself to the crowd in this moment, this first instant where she loses that aura of power and beauty and queenliness, but more importantly for her as a person, as a woman. Disrobing in public, in front of thousands of people, showing your naked body? I mean, it denies any sort of analysis, doesn't it? How can we even connect with such a nightmare? It just boggles our mind. The effects on self-worth, on the feeling of vulnerability, on privacy or objectification. We could go on and on and on, the list would never end. But we know that right here, from the off, this is one of the most major, and one of the very worst, moments of Cersei's life. And to be honest, I don't think we need to get any further than this to know that for all our hatred of Cersei and wanting her to get hers and whatever else, this definitely is not it. No satisfaction can be gained here. We honestly have to feel for her and for the other women put in similar situations over the ages. Or just for how women are treated and viewed in the society in general, because this is a pretty good representation when you get down to it. We probably already knew that we'd never gain any of those feelings from what was going to happen, but now we know. And again, in terms of the story, the overall series, it's huge. Cersei was built up as that ice queen that you could not break. And now look. And in this single paragraph, we have three difficulties already coming. The first is the most basic and probably the easiest to bear, but that doesn't mean it should be discounted. The physicality of it all. Unlike the show, this is happening in winter. It's cold, it's getting cold all the time. It's not the only reason that Cersei is shivering, but it's definitely part of it. And this side of things will be repeatedly referenced once she actually begins the walk on her bare feet. For all the talk of how this is emotional abuse, it's physical abuse as well, and Cersei's going to get considerable injuries later on. Would you want to walk through a modern city in bare feet? No, and definitely not this one either. And yes, we can make the point that thousands of people do have to walk through it barefoot every day, and Cersei couldn't have cared less in the past. That's all absolutely true, but we can hold both ideas in our head. Just keep this in mind as we go. The second difficulty is the shame. It comes on her immediately as she tells us that she has to fight not to cover herself as her grandfather's mistress did. She has to physically fight, digging her nails into her hands, but she does resist. She's still the strong lioness, refusing to squirm for the crowd. And she does that by reminding herself that she is beautiful. Jamie said so. Even abusive Robert did. But the third is the most frightening. They looked at Ned Stark the same way though. And that is to say, hungrily and hatefully. Both of which she manufactured both of which she must experience now. 
So we begin in truth, as Cersei descends the steps and starts her walk so she can just get it over with, alongside her party of septons and swords. And it doesn't take that many steps before she reaches the crowd, and the first insult to come is probably the one you'd expect, and do forgive me for having to say this awful word. Whore! Someone cried out. A woman's voice. Women were always the cruelest where other women were concerned. Well, we know that to be true, because Cersei has been showing us constantly. But it also says something that this is the first, and the most common insult. Of course, this is what they rely on in terms of the worst things they can say, because this society, as we said earlier, demonises women for the roles that that same society places them in. It's very close to what Asher was saying earlier about that particular C word. Insult women for what you value them most for. We see it here again, and that's a very, very deep discussion that we could get into regarding sexual attitudes toward women, and sexual workers, and all of that. Unfortunately, we don't really have the time. Cersei lets it roll past her as she reviews her mental tactics for getting through this. Keep viewing the crowd as hopeless nobodies who have nothing better to do while she remains a somebody. Of course, that's another tactic of the punishment, seemingly lowering Cersei to the same level as the small folk that she despises and who most of the upper class, including Kevin, also despise. She is just going to ignore them. She is literally going to keep her eyes on the prize as she stares up at the Red Keep, a home that she has never loved, but is all she wants in the world right now. It means salvation, she says, but only if Kevin has kept his end of the bargain. And again, I just get that vision of her getting there and the gates being closed and no one answering, that she will eventually just be abandoned to the mob. Ugh, horrible idea. I don't want to envision that anymore. Now we have an important thought from Cersei. He wanted this. Him and the High Sparrow. And the Little Rose as well, I do not doubt. I have sinned and I must atone. Must parade my shame before the eyes of every beggar in the city. They think this will break my pride. They will make an end to me. But they are wrong. So it wouldn't be Cersei if she wasn't slipping in some paranoid accusations in there, such as this one from Marjorie, that really makes no sense, even if she did have motivation for such. But she's echoing our thoughts on Kevin and the High Sparrow, as we've covered plentifully now, so at least she has the right idea about that. The beginning continues with the Scepters ringing their shame bell, the entertainment aspect continuing with someone trying to sell pies, and already Cersei has to watch her step. They pass the famous statue of Baylor, who Cersei definitely isn't a fan of at the best of times, but let alone now. And then another insult comes, along the same lines as the first, then we get the first rotten vegetable. That one misses, but you can see how the crowd are already testing the waters, seeing what they can get away with, and we remember how quickly that can turn into a tide. Cersei repeats her lioness phrase. She continues ignoring, but George is doing an excellent job of making us feel the physical elements here. The noise, the press, the build of it all, and how horrible that is. But she keeps on going. She's still staring ahead, still focusing on that prize and thinking of Tommen. Yet, we've only covered the easiest part the plaza, and that seemed long enough for her. Now we're going to get into the city proper, where the walking will be harder, the press will be thicker. That will not only slow progress, but it will be a lot more dangerous to get out of if something does go wrong. We see that now, as the poor fellows continue to shove, but the lack of space makes it ineffective. There's nowhere to go, so the atmosphere becomes even more clawing and tense than before. Worst of all, when she half slips, she loses sight of the Red Keep, thanks to the buildings all being closer together. That was her focus, her safety valve, and it becomes so much harder without it. The bells, the shouts of shame. George really focuses in on that escapable noise, as he's done with John Con and with Catelyn and with many others before. Cersei even says that it sounds so much louder and closer. Now she has to wait because the streets are so jammed, and this horrible experience is lasting even longer than it needs to, which is the most frustrating of all. We get the sense of everything just ratcheting up a few more levels. The insults are coming from everywhere and becoming all the more vulgar. Perhaps more worryingly, there are shouts for Stannis and Marjorie. Oh, Marjorie is more understandable, but someone sure has a long memory to still be sharing out Stannis. Only the truly loyal and steadfast would still be bothering of that, and that means likely they could resort to violence, they could go for broke if they really want to get a political message across. Again, George hammers us with the physicalness of it all, the disgustingness. It's likely worse for Cersei, given that she's always lived her life surrounded by the very best, until she was recently thrown in a cell anyway, but that doesn't make it easier to read. She's walking through urine, rotten food is thrown at her, then a dead cat that explodes all over her naked legs. It's awful, it's horrible, and George keeps at it because he wants us to really think of what Cersei is experiencing. He also speaks to the idea of both Cersei being sent down to their level, but the small folk grasping any opportunity they get to feel better than someone else. It's not that they get many opportunities, is it? So to be able to do that with a queen, a terrible queen who mistreated them, you know they're going to revel in it. Combine that with the names and the contempt and the obvious disrespect, and what's clear is that this whole thing has been devastatingly effective. Cersei will never impress or intimidate or rule these people ever again. 
Still, she manages to keep it together somehow. It's fairly rare that we ever get to be impressed with Cersei, but we have to give it to her. She's still ignoring them. She's still considering them beneath her. She's still walking on. If only if it was to stay this way for the whole journey. But as we've always suspected, that is not the case. She's halfway down Fasenia's hill when she falls, slipping an excrement when it really begins to go wrong. She starts to feel the venom in the crowd as they laugh at her pain. And then her well-practiced defences fall. She makes the mistake of looking back. You should listen to Daenerys, Cersei, never do that. And it seems like she's made no progress at all. And that wounds her so much, we know that type of feeling. She's lost sight of the Red Keep again. She's lost all her bearings. And this one crack allows it to all come rushing in. You can see how she's beginning to lose it. She starts to disassociate. She's babbling. She's lost where she is. She can't remember Theoden's name. Those rock-solid defences are gone. And now it's all happening at once. The tension is spilling for us also, when Theoden says the crowd is growing unruly and she needs to take note of that. We're worried about the riots and all those memories coming to life. The crowd is growing unruly, he said. Yes, she thought. Unruly. I am not afraid. You should be. He's having to pull or more drag her down the hill, on an injured foot no less, so some of her decency and pride have gone with that as well, to say nothing of the physical pain. Where she had done so well, relying on herself and saying that's all she needs so far, that also begins to shatter as she wishes for Jamie again. Jamie who can do no wrong and who would protect her from all. Though it's not conscious, this is her first admittance that she can't do it on her own. We can see why she dreams of Jamie because her reality is getting so much worse. She's slicing her feet open on something again. She's coming to physical harm and the veneer is broken as she deigns to start blaming everyone. She spits at Vanilla that she could have had sandals. She mentally blasts Fearden for even touching her because she is the queen and should never be touched. That's a base belief that she's clinging to now and you can see how much she is slipping. The bottom of the hill brings some relief in terms of wider streets and the views of the Red Keep. Progress has been made and she's still proud enough to get rid of Fearden and limp on alone. She doesn't need help or protection, but a lot of damage has been done. Now a different pain emerges as the crowd starts actively commenting on her body or comparing it to others. She's put below a commoner's wife, a sex worker, a random mother. She's called a hundred different names as they all tear her self-image apart. And it makes sense that this is what finally breaks her. Not the insults or the hurled fruit, but the realisation of what they think of her, what they see, where she stands in their hierarchy and what she's truly become. She's even admitting that she has sinned, just as a very clear sign of how far she's gone. But if we really want to talk breaking, then that occurs now as she basically starts hallucinating due to the mental pain. Guilt and shame tie together as she thinks that she sees her father in the crowd. So shame there. Then Malara Heatherspoon and Ned for your guilt. And even Sansa to remind her of what she wanted to be and what she feared. And speaking of such, the old paranoia and obsession surfaces when she sees a laughing Tyrion. It's always laughing and jeering, which is odd considering that's Tyrion's biggest weakness as well. The final face is Joffrey, her greatest source of pain for a painful life. And it's fitting that makes her fall for a second time. So her grip loosens. She's shivering again. She's actually begging for mercy. She's saying she doesn't deserve this. All her shields are cracked. Septa Morel offers no sympathy, but Anella, of all people, does take some pity and reassures her that she's nearly done, that they are at the bottom of Aegon's high hill. There is just one last part to go. Unfortunately, we know how these things work, and invariably, the last part insists on being the hardest. That turns out to be true, as the crowd, now full of people pouring out a rough, tough flea bottom, are at their most cruel, their most vindictive, their most rude, to put it simply. The words are the same, although abomination is thrown in there just to tie us back to the prologue and Bran's old thoughts about monsters in this book, but they are said with even more venom, and then that is combined with further dehumanisation and disrespect by men exposing themselves at her. And again, for the second chapter in a row, George takes us to Horror Town as Cersei describes these twisted, hideous faces pressing in on all sides. She describes them as roaches scuttling around every step, and sees real monsters out there with filed teeth and weeping sores, all of them shouting or laughing or hungering after her. It's an almost trippy experience to try and imagine, as it gets worse and worse, closer and closer, louder and louder, until finally, these monsters get through to her. And I'll read you the quote at length. Words are wind, she thought. Words cannot hurt me. I am beautiful. The most beautiful woman in all Westeros. Jamie says so. Jamie would never lie to me. Even Robert. Robert never loved me. But he saw that I was beautiful. He wanted me. She did not feel beautiful though. She felt old. Used. Filthy. Ugly. There were stretch marks on her belly from the children she had borne. And her breasts were not as firm as they had been when she was younger. Without a gown to hold them up, they sagged against her chest. I should not have done this. I was their queen, but now they've seen. They've seen. They've seen. I should never have let them see. Gowned and crowned, she was a queen. Naked. Bloody, limping, she was only a woman, not so very different from their wives, more like their mothers than their pretty little maiden daughters. What have I done? At long last, the spell is broken. 
thanks to her old enemy of the people, she sees the reality of her body. And unfortunately, because of her own issues about the worth of women and how that ties into physical beauty, that realisation is incredibly damaging. She's obviously been holding it at bay for so long due to this very reason, but it's all slipped through her fingers and is now burning at her. But that's actually secondary. Though we shouldn't downplay the huge mental effect it has on her, the more important part is her realising what this does to her aura, her ability to command respect or seem higher than them. She knows that is shattered, it is gone. She knows that this was a mistake, that the coach has finally turned back into a pumpkin and nothing will ever be the same. And to go back to the physical part of it, we know of course that part of her body's changes are completely natural. They're consistent with both time and motherhood. And okay, true, she's contributed to a lot of it with her over drinking, for example, and that should be considered also. But the point is how she and the crowd perceive such changes, which is to say, unfairly. After everything, it's these thoughts that finally have her crying. That loss of position, that loss of worth and the breaking of the spell. And this is her worst nightmare, remember, crying out in public, in front of the worms, as she calls them. She still denies that. She still clings to her strength until there is one final face in the crowd, Maggie the Frog, declaring her prophecy one last time. Queen you shall be, she hissed, until there comes another, younger and more beautiful, to cast you down and take all that you hold most dear. And then there was no stopping the tears. She's lost. After everything she's done, all the lengths that she went to, the murder, torture, plotting, betrayal, selling out her own body, after all those efforts and the planning to avoid these specific words, it has come true. Remember, this prophecy has ruled all of Cersei's teen and adult life. It's nothing short of an obsession and has absolutely governed her. It has forever been her greatest fear, and here she is, with it staring her in the face. She has been cast down. She is no longer a queen, no longer young, no longer beautiful, and according to the views of her family, her society, and herself, that means she is nothing at all. So the waves of pain flow in as those shields finally collapse. She becomes exactly what she didn't want to be as she covers her body. She feels her shame, and she shows her fear as she tries to run. She trips and falls, and this time there's no getting up. The next thing she knew, she was crawling, scrambling uphill on all fours like a dog, as the good folk of King's Landing made way for her, laughing and jeering and applauding her. So, the lasting image of Cersei Lannister, the Queen. That's a dark, disturbing moment that really strikes our core. It's horrible. And of all the people we read about in this series, Cersei is one of the most deserving of horrible things. But I'll say it again, not this. No one is deserving of this. Maybe Peter fucking Baelish, I must admit, but you get my point. Plus, it just gets us uncomfortable at just how terrible a collective people can be. But finally, here, at her lowest point, Cersei breaks through a crimson line of Lannister guards. She passes the gate and returns to her home. And her first thought is Tommen. She just went through hell, she wants her bloody prize. But she's told he's not there, and as much as Cersei might want him, that is absolutely the right call, because I do not want to imagine the effect that such a sight would have on him. But we likely forget that, just because we're so angry at the presence of Kevin Lannister, come to admire his handiwork and revel in his niece brought so low. But then we get this quote, A shadow fell across them both, blotting out the sun. Now we have the real reason of why Cersei put herself through such a thing, as we have one of our greatest inversions. Instead of the princess being rescued by the hero, we have the evil queen being rescued by a monster, which Cersei hits on by thinking of giants and dreams and stories. But she also hits us with the reality, as the quote. Her saviour was real, eight feet tall or maybe taller, with legs as thick around as trees. He had a chest worthy of a plough horse and shoulders that would not disgrace an ox. His armour was plate steel, enamelled white and bright as a maiden's hope and worn over gilded mail. A great helm hid his face. From its crest streamed seven silken plumes in the rainbow colours of the faith. A pair of golden seven-pointed stars clasped his billowing cloak at the shoulders. A white cloak. Then Kyburn is here, making his debut, still ever loyal to his queen, and pronouncing that this is Sir Robert Strong, a new member of the Kingsguard, newly in service to Cersei, and that he, Kyburn, has delivered the vehicle to allow Cersei back to vengeance and prosperity. If it please your grace, Sir Robert has taken a holy vow of silence, Kyburn said. He has sworn that he will not speak until all of his grace's enemies are dead, and evil has been driven from the realm. Yes, thought Cersei Lannister. Oh yes. What a goose prickle ending. We thought we had enough of that of Aya, obviously not. That Cersei, after suffering through all that horribleness and cruelty and breaking, sees a final upswing in the final seconds because she's been gifted this literal personal monster and she's clearly already thinking of what she can do with him. We can almost hear the cackles, can't we? And our minds start whirring at just what we're going to see from Cersei going forward. We know it's going to be wicked and we're hungry to see it. But in the meantime, we have this absolutely superb ending to get us hungry for that Winds of Winter plot. Oof. 
There's so much to think about from these ending paragraphs. I think even most first-timers figure that this is a renamed Gregor Kagane just due to the physical description, but even that simple acknowledgement gets us wondering, what the hell has Kaiben been up to? Is Gregor healed? Has he risen as a thing of the dead? Does he even have a head? We've got to ask that again. What the hell got sent to Dawn in his place? We get no answers here, of course, but most seem to settle on this being some kind of weird necromancy slash science experiment from Kyburn. He's confirmed as our cackling, lightning backgrounded madman, creating a monster. We have more than enough tales from literature to compare both that relationship of creator and monster and the one of Cersei's of monster servant with an even more monstrous master. I think many assume we're going to see something resembling what the show had in a silent vessel of unimaginable strength. A literal monster is the only way to put it. And yes, we figure Cersei will use him to secure her freedom via a try by combat, making it funny that he's dressed in faith-based arraignment, but we very much doubt it's going to stop there. A thing we spoke about back in Feast, or maybe even further back than that, is that Cersei has always lacked the simple requirement of this land and the world, a physical weapon. She had the name, she had the power, the wealth, if we really want to link it back to Varys' old riddle, but she never had the stick, or not one she could trust or use effectively. Now, she's just been handed the keys to the biggest stick ever, and we likely think that even if he had arrived at the peak of Cersei's reign, before all this nastiness she's just been through, the ideas of how she might use and deploy him would be enough to give us nightmares. But now, after she's been put through all that, after she's been mentally broken and will have no holds barred whatsoever in terms of restriction or morality, well, you shudder to think what this Sir Robert could do. Kevin's ghost might end up being quite glad that Varys got to him first. And there's the naming as well, Sir Robert. I'm sure we'll get a later explanation on why that name was chosen, but I think it's going to link into him being what Cersei thinks her husband should have been, a protector, someone dedicated to her, someone who would use his strength to help her, someone who loved her. Robert was not that. This one might be on some level. But let's again think on Cersei's future after this, because it seems like it's going to get pretty dark. It was already, but now she'll effectively be Cersei with all safety restrictions lifted. She'll be thrown in as a chaos maker. Her certain goals now can't be achieved, then she'll simply make as much trouble as she can, whether that be for the Tyrells, for Aegon, even for Daenerys. Her revenge list is going to be longer than ever, so the combination of this being the wildest Cersei yet with the worst weapon? Well, we can only guess what's going to come in wins. There's any amount of storylines we could begin to guess at. The trials and Marjorie, the hole left by Kevin's death, whether she'll literally try to kidnap her own son, or maybe even get the both of them out of there into Castle Rock once Aegon does come knocking. There's loads. If she doesn't choose that, then we'll have considerable questions on how she will enter it with Aegon or Arianne or John Connington. And Euron is always a question on many people's mind. What about Tommen? What if he's killed by a sand snake as we theorised? The list goes on and on, but this is a superb way of getting us hungry for that. What about the chapter here today, though? This awful, awful chapter. This terrible chapter that is hard to read, but is an absolute triumph of George's writing ability. I think we pretty much covered it in the text, so I'm not going to bash you about the head with those too much, and you can probably hear my voice is on its way out. But it's another absolute corker. And no, I don't think it's quite on eyes level. I had two really great chapters. This is really the Cersei one that we pay attention to. But it's a definite, definite dramatic mark at the end of this book. It really hits you hard, even if we do have to wait for some of the other big plot points. So again, thank you, George, for including that. But for two late additions to two chapter arcs, I and Cersei being back to back here. Wow, George, what a choice. That is just superbly brilliant. And to be honest, uh, I've got many, many more thoughts about Cersei. Maybe they'll come out at another point. Again, I've been lucky enough to talk to some of you about them. This is a chapter you could just never stop talking about, but I'm going to have to before my voice runs out because we've still got two more parts to come, everybody. Just two. Seven more chapters. And then we are done. So let me tell you of the next four that we're going to cover. Because if you think this one's been big, if you think this has been a day of goodbyes and cliffhangers and big plot points to discuss, well, next week, that's going to blow your socks off. Because we will begin with Tyrion... 12 his final chapter of course so that alone tells you at what level we are now a member of the triforce of our central trio is having his last chapter this is it well truly truly at the end and it's a fairly subdued chapter for Tyrion, but with a very big cliffhanger ending as we detail him and the second sons and what's coming to marine now we're going to stay in marine quite a lot next week actually because after that we'll get our last non-ending chapter in barristan three the kingbreaker a thrilling chapter where Barry finally starts to act, oaths be damned. Then we stay pretty much right next door as we go to Quentin Four, the Dragon Tamer. I don't think you need any explanation of what's going to happen in that one. And then, well, those three kind of get left in the dust because we have John 13, the last John chapter. Again, 
I think you know the ending of that one. I think you can guess we're going to have quite a bit to say. So that is next week, everybody. That will be part 18. I don't know how we've got here, but we have. Thank you again for, for your listens and your retweets and everything like that. I hope to see you back on the aisle next week. Thank you, thank you a million times, thank you. We will see you then back on the aisle. Thanks, everybody.